it's a great pleasure for me to introduce this day meeting on uh, Linnaeus, race and sex. Uh, and welcome to all our attendees. Um, back in, I think it was either November 2018 or April 2019, uh, Stella approached me while she was doing research in the library. And she discussed with me the possibility of organi organizing such a meeting. So this was before COVID, and I am delighted that we have kept this event on our schedule, even if it is now online rather than in the building, as we had hoped at one point during the autumn that might be possible by now. Um, I'm incredibly thankful uh, to Stella for coming to us with the initiative to organize this meeting at the Linnean Society, because it is both topical and important so I'm just gonna give a, a quick introduction uh, before I pass on to Stella. Um, race and sex are two huge societal concerns. They are concepts that have shaped the history of our century, the 20th century and, and before that, and that we are still grappling with in search for a more equal society. So one, one could ask if these are contemporary concerns, what does the Linnean Society and Carl Linnaeus have to do with this? Um, and I'm going to backtrack for any attendees who don't know much about the uh, Linnaean Society or, our, or why we have the collections of Carl Linnaeus. The, um, uh, the Linnaean Society founder, James Edward Smith, bought the collections of Carl Linnaeus in 1784, uh, Carl Linnaeus being a 18th century Swedish naturalist, as I'm, I'm sure all of you here know. Uh, and these included his books, his manuscripts, his correspondence and his specimens of pressed plants, pressed fish, shells and insects, all of which we have uh, at the Linnean Society in our building in Piccadilly. Linnaeus is best known as a world famous taxonomist whose systems of classifications are no longer used, but whose binomial nomenclature revolutionized the way organisms are named and scientists communicate with each other still today. So his work had a long lasting repercussion on the way Europeans see and name uh, the natural world. So I receive Google alerts for the name of Linnaeus and for almost every article that pops up into my inbox with a link to the article, I get uh, generally very excited, but often it's only because his name is briefly mentioned in the introduction of the paper uh, so as the beginning of the narrative. So for example, if the paper is a scientific one, it starts with Linnaeus first naming a particular species in one of his seminal works. Uh, if it's a plant, then it'll refer to Species Plantarum 1753. If it's an animal, generally the 10th edition of Systema Naturae 1758. Um, and if the article is on racism or the history of racism, it often starts with Linnaeus's classification of man in uh, Systema Naturae 1758. So if he's such a central figure, a, a starting point for a lot of these narratives, as I said, and for these two fun fundamental issues that we're going to talk about today, we need to understand him, um, his work, and the impact of his work better. So um, it's not for me to, in this introduction to say too much about uh, race and sex in Linnaeus's works. I will leave that to the speakers. But my sense is that the issue of sex, um, which stemmed from Linnaeus's most famous system of classification of plants, the sexual system, uh, first published in 1735, has been discussed pretty much ever since Linnaeus published his works. Uh, but also in the last few years, uh, in the context of gender and taken up by feminist historians, such as, for example, Londa uh, Schiebinger. The issue of race is one that the Linnean Society is keen to face full on following the Black Lives Matter protest in last summer. Uh, and that they, they, these protests and, and the whole debate around them has had ramifications throughout the whole of the Linnean Society in the way we think about our collections, we think about cataloging our collections, in the way we organize our events and uh, in the way we strive uh, to be more inclusive and diverse in our fellowship. But more specifically to this event, um, a lot of attention has been drawn to Linnaeus's classification of man in the wake of the protests, uh, and even before that in works on the history of racism. 
And because as a society, we are so intricately linked to Linnaeus, we take our name from him, we have his collections, we have felt as the Linnaean society that we needed to look at this issue directly. So for myself, um, uh, I've worked with uh, Stefan Müller-Wille, who's uh, one of our panel uh, speakers today and probably one of the foremost uh, scholars working on Linnaeus today. Um, and I, and so I, I went back to Linnaeus's works because I was struck that uh, in all this debate, generally, we always go back to Linnaeus's one work of Systema Naturae 10 Tradition, 1758. But we have all his books uh, and mostly all of his manuscripts at the Linnaean Society. So I've been particularly intrigued to understand why Linnaeus made a shift in his classification of man from one that was based on relatively straightforward, if simplistic factors, such as uh, geography and skin color in the first edition of Systema Naturae in 1735, to one that encompasses, encompasses all the hallmarks of racism as we understand it today in the 10th edition of Systema Naturae 1758. And I wrote a piece about this on our website, trying to go back to Linnaeus's manuscripts that would kind of fill, fill that gap uh, and to understand where and why that shift happened. But I think this is research that needs more work uh, and that has prompted discussions with uh, Stefan. Um, so I am absolutely delighted that we are hosting a frank discussion, I hope, of Linnaeus's work and its impact on these two vital issues that shape our society. And I want to thank Stella again for organizing this timely event and allowing this discussion to take place. I also want to thank all the speakers for their participation and I very much look forward to what I think uh, will be a very thought provoking day and hopefully enlighten uh, some of us on these issues. Thank you. Uh, and Stella, I uh, pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Stella Sandford. I'm um, Professor of Philosophy in the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University. I'm very grateful to the uh, Linnaean Society for hosting this day meeting under their auspices and for the help um, in setting up and doing that. So especially help from Padma, who we met at the beginning. And I'm really delighted to see our speakers brought together today, if only virtually, because we did keep hoping and hoping and hoping that we would it would be able to be um, an in-person event. But anyway, I'm pleased um, to see everybody here and pleased to see so many participants. I can see people joining there. So thank you to everybody for coming. Now, um, I will be introducing each of our speakers um, in turn before their talks, but I'd, I would like to introduce the day by saying something about the rationale for the topic, Linnaeus, race and sex. That is saying something about this conjunction of terms, Linnaeus, race and sex. Now, Isabel has already mentioned um, the social and institutional context of the day meeting. And as we know, there are now many people in museums and similar kinds of institutions like the Linnaean Society, working with their collections to uncover uh, the relations of those collections to histories of slavery and colonialism in particular. And for much longer, actually, scholars and curators have also been making efforts to bring to light and criticize the histories of sexism that have shaped the humanities and the sciences. And part of that has been to reevaluate the contribution of women in these areas. Contributions have tended to be repressed or forgotten. But today, um, our speakers are going to be taking a step back from that kind of hands-on work with collections uh, to look at the textual and conceptual histories or aspects of the textual and conceptual histories of race and sex. And with our final speaker in particular, Marlin R. King, to look at some of the contemporary science that problematizes uh, at least one of those concepts itself. And I think it's fair to say that in one way or another, 
all of our speakers will be provoking us into asking, what are we talking about when we talk about race? And what are we talking about when we talk about sex? But we could also be asking, who are we talking about when we talk about Linnaeus? Because for better or worse, Linnaeus's work is frequently associated with the concepts of sex and race, as Isabel has already said, uh, because of his infamous sexual system of botanical classification and the incredible sexual metaphorics of his work on the sexuality of plants. Um, and his equally infamous classification of racial human types in his system of nature, as Isabel has also mentioned. Now, of course, many of Linnaeus's contributions to the natural sciences are well known and rightly celebrated, but a full assessment of his legacy must also include investigation into these more uncomfortable areas. Um, and assessing Linnaeus's legacy uh, with regard to race and sex, um, because it's only, it's only, if we want to think about the relationship between historical material and historical figures and the concerns of the present, it can't just be, we can't just be talking about that figure in their own time. We need to be talking about the legacy of that figure. And assessing Linnaeus's legacy with regard to race and sex means, as I said, going beyond Linnaeus's work to think about the ways that the work was received and interpreted to think about the way that the work has been represented and perhaps misrepresented, uh, to think about what Linnaeus's work inspired and influenced, how others developed it, uh, how it lives on today and what our contemporary concerns and the current state of scientific knowledge mean for how we might interpret Linnaeus anew. So the name Linnaeus then is more than the proper name of a historical personage it's also a name encompassing various cultural and scientific constellations connected to various social and intellectual histories and values. And it's this Linnaeus who's at stake today as much as the man himself. And it's possibly, it's, it's possibly that Linnaeus whose name we see in the Linnaean society as well. So not all of our speakers are gonna be speaking about Linnaeus directly, although some are. But all of them are speaking into this context of this conjunction of terms, Linnaeus in the broadest sense, race and sex. And we've set aside ample time in each session for questions and contributions from the audience in the chat. Um, and we do hope that everybody will feel free to participate. So I'd like to frame these discussions by saying something about the different histories of the concepts of race and sex and how these uh, figure in the relevant 18th century discourses. In theoretical work in the humanities and the social sciences and in political and activist circles, we've become used to the idea of intersectionality. Intersectional analysis quite rightly attempts to acknowledge and understand the relations between different axes of oppression and discrimination in the effort to avoid uh, race and sex, for example, being seen as, I quote, mutually exclusive categories of experience and analysis, which is how Kimberly Cranshaw put it in 1989. Kimberly Cranshaw introduced the idea of intersexuality, uh, intersectionality into um, it, it legal studies initially, but it's now, we, we see it across all of the disciplines. So, uh, Intersectionality is important because it, it, it helps us to avoid thinking that there's no relation between things like race and sex. But this doesn't mean that the different histories of different types of discrimination aren't important. And part of understanding these different histories and recognizing their contemporary manifestations involves understanding the different histories of the concepts, in this case, race and sex. And this is one way to begin answering the question, what, what are we talking about when we talk about race? What are we talking about when we talk about sex? Scholars disagree about the origin of the idea of race in its modern sense, that is the sense in which it is applied to human beings. In many languages, versions of the word race were in use before it was used to describe uh, human diversity. And indeed, it's still used in this older sense in zoology and botany, 
uh, sometimes as a synonym of species, sometimes to refer to varieties or breeds. So class is the word for breed in French. Um, the history of the idea of race in its modern sense is in part the history of the application of this, work to, this word to humans, to refer to a group with a common ancestry and then to a group with a presumed discrete geographical origin and specific, usually heritable physical characteristics, notably skin color. And I think that uh, Josias Tembo and Stefan Mullavilla will be addressing these aspects of the idea of race uh, amongst others. Although the word race is still used in relation to other animals and plants, the idea of racialized groups is used exclusively in relation to humans. And it's of course this sense of race that's at issue today. In order to talk about the history of race in this modern sense, we have to distinguish between the concept and the word. The fact that we find the word race in a text does, doesn't necessarily indicate that the author of the text is using the word in the modern sense, but equally the absence of the precise word race doesn't necessarily mean that an author does not intend to discuss something like race in the modern sense or is not referring to racialized groups. The matter is linguistically complicated by the fact that the Greek and Latin terms which are sometimes translated with the word race are genos and genus, words which obviously have a far broader meaning than the modern term race. So even to decide whether or not a 17th or 18th century author, for example, is talking about race in the modern sense is not a straightforward matter, unless the author makes that particularly clear. Linnaeus seems to be discussing something like race in the modern sense in his system of nature, when he distinguishes between human beings on the basis of skin color, and even more so in the 10th edition when he, of the system of nature, when he proposes social and moral correlates for these groups. But he never uses the word race, rather he speaks of varieties, as Stefan may well uh, discuss in more detail later. The French naturalist and philosopher Buffon, on the other hand, does use the word race in French, but does not divide humans into discrete racial categories and uses the term in, um, in various ways, referring, for example, to generations and breeds. Indeed, it seems that in refusing discrete racial categories, Buffon was opposing himself to what he at least took to be Linnaeus's too arbitrary and too reductive divisions, division of humans into mainly four racial types. So for Buffon, the term race seems to mean primarily, primarily a variety that deviates from an ideal type. And of course that can only give rise to racism when applied to human beings. There are then arguments to be had about exactly what, what each meant and how we should interpret their words. But the general point that I want to make with regard to both Linnaeus and Buffon is this, that their work, uh, both in its textual specificity and in its later interpretations and influence, is caught up in the history of racial thinking and it needs to be addressed uh, now in that context. Now from the 1770s, there was no doubt but that one prominent philosopher was very clearly talking about race. In a series of essays, the German uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant, in what is really his primary contribution to the life sciences, uh, he sought to clarify the idea of race, both terminologically and conceptually. Because Kant proposed the first scientific theory of the nature of the differences between the so-called human races, he's often thought of as the inventor of the concept in its modern sense. Now, of course, his theory doesn't pass muster from the standpoint of modern science, but the point is that it was articulated within the scientific context of his day, and it was presented and received as a scientific theory. The context of Kant's theory of race was his attempt to provide a philosophical justification or of philosophical underpinning for attempts in natural history to outline uh, what's called a natural system of nature. So that is, a, he was trying to provide a philosophical justification or a philosophical underpinning for attempts to produce classifications of living beings that were natural classifications, not simply ad hoc or artificial um, 
classifications. He was he was trying to uh, he he was contributing towards the project of the construction of a natural system by trying to provide the philosophical foundations for it, so that the the classifications would reflect natural divisions. They would reflect real divisions in nature, not artificial divisions. And as you probably know, these are, these attempts at uh, at natural systems were first and foremost made in botany. Now the problem can be seen as the problem of finding the natural genus, the problem of grouping plants and then subsequently animals into natural, not just artificial genera. And for Kant, as for many others actually, the artificial method was exemplified by Linnaeus's sexual system of the classification of plants which picked out particular static characteristics of organisms as the basis for classification. Um, so this is a practical and logical, but abstract and in some sense arbitrary uh, method. Kant called it a school system for memory, not a natural system. Um, now Linnaeus was perfectly aware of the extent to which his system was artificial, he didn't shy away from recognizing that at all. Um, and although, of course, he was concerned primarily with plants, the method was extended to his general zoological taxonomy. I mean, the, the abstract method of, of basing, uh, of picking out static characteristics was extended to his general zoological taxonomy, which included, as we know, the notorious anthropological divisions. So that's the context. Kant set himself the philosophical task of clarifying the meaning of a natural genus. And this would need to include, he argued, consideration of historical relations of descent and generation. And he defined a natural genus as a group that shared a common descent or a common stem. And members of such groups were identified as being able to produce fertile offspring, which is of course Buffon's uh, criteria for membership of a species. But the most important point is this, Kant worked out a general theory of the natural genus for natural history via his theory of the difference between the human races specifically. All human beings, he thought, comprised one genus. They came from one common origin, but he also argued that humans comprised four different races and he defined a race in terms of the unfailing inheritance of a peculiar characteristic in the case of human skin color. Kant's theory of race claims that as humans spread out over the earth, uh, different environmental conditions in different uh, parts of the world called, caused the original germs or seeds that were lodged in the beginning in all human beings, or at least in all of, of in early ancestors, caused the, the different environmental conditions caused those original germs or seeds to be expressed in different ways in different climates. And once a germ had been expressed in a certain way, for example, through skin color, uh, other germs were suppressed. Um, and via this differential expression of germs in different parts of the world, uh, humans became fixed as he saw it into four, into the four human uh, races. Now Kant's theory of race didn't go unchallenged, but it was nevertheless very influential and two things in particular are important about it historically. First, it gave what we would now call a biological explanation for what Kant saw as a fixed natural division. Because although environmental factors influenced the expression of the germs that made the races, the important point for Kant was that those germs were within us. Uh, part of our biological inheritance. Uh, second, although, although it's anachronistic to use the word biology there, but you take my point. Secondly, although Kant's theory proposed that all humans comprised one genus, he didn't distinguish between the concepts of genus and species, it also introduced a new terminal taxonomical category for the classification of human beings initially, the category of race. Now taxonomical categories, as we know, named fixed levels or ranks within a hierarchical system of the classification of nature. So uh, for example, we have species, genus, family, order, and so on. These are taxonom taxonomical categories. Others saw 
that Kant's new terminal taxonomical category of race, which was now, as far as Kant was concerned, properly defined and indeed justified, could be used to classify animals too. But in practice, the term in its modern usage in this taxonomical sense became associated prim primarily with humans. And this is a significant part of the idea that fueled European racism, the idea that race is a natural, uh, biological and taxonomical category that can be used to classify the diversity of the human species. And it's quite uncomfortable to ask ourselves how much of this survives in the way in which we're asked to state our ethnic origin on census forms and so on. It's quite urgent that we distinguish between this history of biological race thinking and the need to be able to talk about racialization and racialized groups in order to identify and contest racism. I mean, of course, critical race theorists have been doing this for decades. Lawrence Blum defines racialization as the practice and outcome of treating groups as if there were inherent and immutable differences between them and as if certain somatic characteristics mark the presence of significant characteristics of mind, emotion and character, and as if some were of greater worth than others. That is, uh, racialization is the practice and outcome of treating groups as if there were races in Kant's sense. Now, I've been talking so far about Kant, mostly not Linnaeus, but my point is that Kant's project was in part to offer a philosophical and scientific justification for the kind of racial classification that Linnaeus had pioneered. Linnaeus tabulated racial diversity, including these classifications of human diversity into a general zoological classification for the first time. But what was his justification for that? What was the theoretical basis for it? Kant thought that Linnaeus's classifications were basically you know, more or less descriptively correct, but ungrounded or unjustified. They were mere description of nature, as Kant put it, not natural history proper. So Kant effectively attempts to supply that justification for Linnaeus. Kant's theory is part of the legacy of Linnaeus's anthropological divisions. He is part of the historical constellation Linnaeus, race and sex. As I've said, Linnaeus called the different groups of humans varieties. And I'm sure that this is something that will be discussed uh, later. Stefan Mollevilla in particular has argued that, I uh, hope I get this right, Linnaeus's racial classifications are not fixed essential types, but the effects of climate and hence that they're primarily geographical categories. Kant's theory of race didn't deny the role of climate in the diversity of human beings. And it too sees the racial categories in geographical terms, but it grounded these aspects, as Linnaeus had not, in a theory of germs, seeds. Climate influenced the expression of germs. Once some germs were expressed, others were suppressed, which according to Kant explains the persistence of the races. Here, as so often in the history of the sciences and the history of philosophy, the oppositions through which we've tended to interpret things can become an obstacle to better understanding. What Kant's theory proposes is that race is not a question of either an, a biological essence or an environmental phenomenon, but the relation between essence and environment. And when that was properly understood, according to Kant, Linnaeus's merely descriptive term variety could become as far as he was concerned, a properly taxonomical and natural category, which Kant and many following him would then call race. So my point there is that Kant is part of Linnaeus's legacy, that when we're thinking about Linnaeus's legacy, we have to, to think as well about what, what happened on the back of Linnaeus's work. And that one of the most significant things is the, is the, the attempted justification of race as a taxonomical category. Now, the case, the case is quite otherwise with the concept of sex. Sex is not, has never been, and indeed it cannot be a taxonomical category. As a classificatory concept, it's of a quite different order. Um, it's, it's a quite different 
as a classificatory context, concept, it is a concept of a quite different kind to the categories of race or species or genus. Modern biological taxonomy acknowledges the difference between male and female as forms, as Ernst Meyer uh, puts it, making sex the same kind of thing in this context as age or seasonal form or morph or or the stages of metamorphosis. That's the only level uh, that sex can occupy in biological taxonomy. It can never be a rank name in taxonomy, which is so, and there is something odd about it, isn't there? Because there's some sense in which we know that sex is not the same as an age form or a, or a moment in metamorphosis or, um, you know, a seasonal form. We know it's something other than that. And yet, its, its status is strange. So although race and sex both come to be articulated in biological terms, they function quite differently in the classification of living beings and are the outcome of quite different histories. Whereas the concept of race was relatively new as a way of uh, conceptualizing human diversity in the 18th century, sex, that is the word used to designate the distinction between male and female, was in use in its original Latin form by the second century CE, and the alleged exclusive duality of the sexes was taken for granted uh, centuries before Linnaeus and Kant. This is seen, for example, in the history of the controversies over whether plants have male and female, whether the sex of plants was seen as an analogy with animals that made their being male and being female, you know, basically metaphorical, or whether that analogy was the basis for the claim that plants were literally sexed, the animal model for sex, or the, even the human model for sex, that, that is what was taken to be the mere fact of sex difference, was um, functioned like an unquestioned given. No one felt the need to justify the concept of sex as they did feel the need to justify the concept of race. This means that when Linnaeus devised his sexual system for the classification of plants, there was much that he could take for granted and little, if anything, that he needed to say about sex per se, little or anything that he needed to justify about sex difference per se. Centuries, even millennia of Western thought had already provided Linnaeus with a rich and often sexist set of social, moral, behavioral and metaphysical associations to the categories male and female. And he could trot these out, secure in the belief that his contemporaries would mostly share those associations and even think of them as natural. The relatively new concept of race in its modern sense had to become itself a topic of scientific definition. People had to explain what they meant by that. But everyone could proceed as if everybody already knew and understood sex and as something already known, absolutely taken for granted, it could provide scientists with a ready made symbolic field of imaginative associations with which their scientific endeavors could be, you know, as it were, adorned. And as Patricia Farah has argued in, in her book, Sex, Botany and Empire, Sexual imagery could give a natural sheen to scientific claims, and these claims in turn could justify certain assumptions about sex. Uh, Patricia describes this self-perpetuating circle in the relations between the social, symbolic and scientific in Linnaeus's sexual system of the classification of plants, um, in privileging the male organs as the first level of classification or the, the privileging of the male organs as the first level of classification reflects the sexual hierarchy of his time, the privileging of the male. And the natural associations of sex have the effect of lending an air of naturalness to his artificial classifications. But at the same time, this shores up the idea that male supremacy is natural, as if to say, look, it's true even in plants, conveniently forgetting, as um, Patricia Farrer says, that the sexual ordering, the sexual hierarchy was inferred from contingent social arrangements in the first place. So there's a, there's a, a, a feedback loop between the social and symbolic aspects of sex and the scientific work in which sex is evoked. 
I think that in the afternoon sessions, Marlin R. King will contest the idea that sex is as straightforward and well understood as the presumption of the male female binary tends to imply. I think that Patricia Farrow will demonstrate how Erasmus Darwin uh, made use of these imaginative associations. All I want to draw attention to here is the different historical genealogies of the concepts of race and sex, the very different forms that these concepts were assuming in the 18th century and their different treatment in the relevant scientific works of the time. At the same time though, sex and race were already undoubtedly entwined in the 18th century imagination. Um, and I would like to end by looking in this regard at the painting that we have used in notices about today's meeting. So I'm just going to share that on my screen. So this painting is by Stephen Slaughter, who was a successful and well-known portrait painter in the 1700s. He painted lots of very eminent people. This was probably painted around 1750. So it's a painting that's contemporaneous with Linnaeus in his prime. Any interpretation of the painting has to account for its complex intersections of race, sex, and what makes it peculiarly appropriate for today's meeting, botany. The painting is part of the collection of the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Connecticut. And, and the museum cites its title as Young Woman with Servant. And according to the Wadsworth catalogue, uh, a quote from the Wadsworth catalogue here, the seated figure is clearly of privileged social status while her standing companion is a servant. Other sources give the title as two women gathering fruit or portrait of two society women. It's not known who these women are. And the Wadsworth is surely projecting unfounded assumptions on the, on the painting with its own title. The painting is unusual, even extraordinary in several ways. The black woman in the painting occupies what is in art historical convention, the place of the superior male standing behind the woman. She lays an intimate, even proprietorial hand on the white woman's shoulder, touching her bare neck and holding one of her braids, uh, I think. The black woman looks directly at the painter and the viewer uh, while the white sitter looks away. The black woman's dress is finer, her jewellery is richer, um, the, the white woman is wearing a kind of aristocratic version of peasant uh, costume, but even though she's kind of dressed up in a, in a costume, as it were, it's clear that, uh, you know, there is nothing poor or uh, in many ways socially inferior about the figure of the black woman there. The black woman is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, let me backtrack a bit. In, in paintings of this era and later, subjects of empire and slaves were often depicted offering fruit to their masters. Um, but that's not what's happening here. It's more like the white woman is holding the fruit for the black woman. The black woman is picking from or holding the fruit and the blossom of a decorative orange tree. Citrus sinensis, as Linnaeus himself named it. The sweet orange and its blossom customarily symbolized purity, marriage and fertility. At this time, it was also a symbol of the wealth and luxury required for its cultivation in Europe. Although we don't know for sure that these women are in Europe, do we? In this painting, Linnaeus, race and sex collide in interesting ways perhaps challenging some of our presumptions. I hope that at the end of the day, we'll be able to say the same thing about this day meeting. Thank you. Um, I see a question. Uh, I'm going to, it's Patricia. I'm just going to allow her to talk. Okay, uh, thank you for a fabulous introduction. I just wanted to ask you, uh, something about that wonderful picture, which I've never ever seen before the poster. And it was really interesting. Uh, in the, I also wondered about the significance of the fruit, because in the Bible, when it tells the story of Eve, 
tempting Adam um, in the Garden of Eden. In the biblical version, it doesn't actually say the word apple. It just says the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I was wondering if there was some sort of symbolism behind that picture that in a way is unifying the two women. That uh, both the women are both innately evil. Never mind that they're different skin colors, they're different classes. They've got this rather ambiguous relationship, but they are both women, hence inferior. I wondered if you thought that was part of the symbolism behind that picture. Well, I think what's so interesting about this painting is that there's just so much going on, and there's so much to say about it, and it's a really it, you know, first and foremost, it's an incredibly unusual depiction of a black person in painting of the mm. era. And, and it's not at all obvious. And I think most, most people who talk about the painting now agree. It's not at all obvious that the black woman is the white woman's servant. It, there's nothing actually really in the, in the painting that suggests that. Um, but there's also, there's such a lot of sexual symbolism in it as well. The, 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 the orange looks a bit like a breast. Uh, there's almost a sexual frisson between the women. There's so much going on there. There's, there's uh, so you could say that certainly they're both being, uh, you know, presented as emblems of sexuality and probably emblems of the wrong kind of sexuality. And the headdress that the black woman is wearing, and she has a feather, in that headdress is a kind of symbol of exoticism or something exotic as well. But I think what's so fascinating about it is that, is that so many different interpretations of the painting are possible, as we can see with the different titles that are given to the painting. Um, nobody knows who the women are. Um, it's strange because he, Slaughter, did paint very famous people generally. Um, and I think the, it's as if the painting kind of tells us nothing can be taken for, for granted in advance. When we, when we come to interpreting the, the relations between race and sex and even botany here and Linnaeus who named the, the rose, um, there's so much to be said. It can't be reduced to one story about what's going on here. Mm, yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful picture. Thank it's you. It's really lovely, isn't it? It's really yeah. wonderful. There is a 20th century painting, and I can't remember the artist now, who painted a, a 20th century hall when this painting was hung at the end of that hall, but still nobody knows who it is. Who the, who oh. it How extraordinary. Thank you. Um, Stella, we have a question from Rosamund Keshwani, and it's kind of a long question. So, Okay, so basically, I'll, I'll summarise. Rosamund is saying we can understand how uh, we might criticize um, Linnaeus's sexual system for the classification of plants and, and the sexual metaphorics that goes with it, but I have trouble understanding how we can critique the sexual division between male and female, given the biological division of uh, reproductive functions. Um, I mean, I'm, I, rather than answer that question myself, I'm going to say, well, listen to what Marlin R. King is going to say later, because I think that her work is all about, uh, or partly about showing us how that sexual division between male and female um, is a lot more complicated than we think it is across the natural world, across all living beings and, and including human beings. So rather than speak to that one myself, I think I'll leave that to the discussion for later. Um, you say you have trouble, difficulty denying the universality of the male-female reproductive division, um, but there are plenty of there are plenty of animals that don't have male and female. Plenty, plenty of living beings that don't have male and female. There are plenty of animals that reproduce parthenogenically, and so on. So, I think it. Uh, I think we should leave that that discussion until later after we've heard what Marlin has to say. There's a question from Norma Clark. Um, do we know anything about where Slaughter was working in the mid-century? Um, uh, there's very, very little information on Slaughter. If you, if you, if you do a quick search online, um, he, he did, he was somewhere, he was mostly in the um, 
He was mostly in the UK, indeed in London. He, uh, he went, he did go, so he was somewhere else in Europe uh, briefly. Is it because you, you might know something about this painting, Norma? Okay, uh, stuff, we'll wait for Norma, but Stefan had a question. Um, yes, thank you. That was a really a nice in, in, introduction. I had a question about um, about sex, although it is an uh, age old uh, category by the 18th century. Um, there's perhaps still a sense in which the 18th century naturalized um, or essentialized the distinction. So Linnaeus, while he takes the categories of male and female for granted, does stress that um, that they constitute a natural natural varieties within a species. That is, uh, the, their differences are not simply due to different um, uh, nourishment, different living conditions, the environment, as we would say today. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, and also, uh, I mean, at the, in the 18th century, in the discussions on the sexes of plants, uh, there was still a very strong element of, of Aristotelian uh, ideas about different meanings of male and female. So th there, there are different male and female individuals. There are, the, there's the recognition now that there's male and female parts, as Aristotle had already recognized of animals you know, millennia ago. But there are also kind of metaphysical principles of male and female and so long as the, as, as the mechanisms of sexual reproduction weren't properly understood, the idea that the male was some kind of inspiriting uh, agent, some, you know, some kind of uh, vivific effluvia, as it was often called in the discussions of plants, um, you know, there's, there are very complicated, still very complicated ideas about what being male and what being female means. And, the shift to the wholly biological understanding, as you say, uh, you know, has has is happening, but has yet to take place completely. But actually, I would argue that we still we still have a metaphysics of sex. We still don't have a wholly biological understanding. There's no such thing in any area of discourse as a wholly biological understanding that doesn't have all sorts of social and uh, political contexts informing it. Uh, Nicola Foster has a question and, uh, and I think Nicola you're up next. Thank you very much. Hello, it was absolutely superb. It was really, really superb. But uh, what, I, what I was just going to say is I, I really enjoyed the way in which we looked at the um, it, it slaughtered work, which is really interesting. Uh, there's recently, well, not quite so recently, I, mean, I think it was in uh, 2018, uh, an exhibition by, um, which was curated by uh, Murrell uh, in the Wallach Museum in New York, which is kind of part of uh, Columbia University. And she made a similar argument about um, Manes Olympia, which is of course, 19th century. So the, the, it, it might be that it is possible to also look at similar issues later on. So it's not necessarily always quite as we think, but actually within culture, it is possible to interpret different, different historical periods. But yeah, it was, it was superb. Thank you so much. And thank you for the day altogether. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It also, I really wanted to speak about the painting as well to say that when we start to talk about things, we need an absolutely interdisciplinary approach. We have to look at art. We did that painting is dated by art historians, by uh, fashion historians. Um, we need we need philosophy. We need history of science. We need science studies. We need gender studies. We need critical race theory. We need everything to help us to to address these issues. We can't do it through just one discipline alone. And art history would be another. If there were a critical art history, that would be another way of addressing these issues. If I may say just one, one other thing. The exhibition was taken from the Wallach to um, the Musée d'Orsay, where it had a completely different interpretation, completely different. Um, and then it was taken to, Guadal to Guadeloupe, um, where again, it, had, uh, it was in a former sugar um, uh, production. So it had a diff very different. So yeah, it's superb. Stella, there's a question from Peter Hallward in the chat, if you want to summarize it. 
um, he's referring to the point at which I said that yeah that's uh, the I I was quoting the systematist Ernst Meyer uh, whose book I can't remember the name of the book it'll come back to me but it's a very famous book on biological systematics um, he 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 mentions that uh, that sex can't be part of any taxonomy and yet one has to recognize different sexual forms and he seems to use this category of form as a general category which encompasses sex difference uh, so for example there are juvenile forms of animals and then there are mature uh, adult forms of animals there's a there's a caterpillar form and then a you know a larval form and a butterfly form um, and it's it's fascinating that he puts sex on the same level as these different forms. Um, it's, I mean, actually, I can only, I can't really answer this in relation to Linnaeus, I can only answer it sort of speculatively, philosophically, by saying it's as if sex is a concept of the level of generality of life itself in, um, in biology, or it's treated as such. That is, it's something that has to be taken for granted, but it is extraordinarily difficult to define. It has to be, it's often just axiomatically there um, and noted, um, but extraordinarily difficult to, to really specify what status, what, what, what theoretical status it has in, uh, in descriptions of nature. Okay, if there are no more questions, then we'll meet you for the next session which will be Stefan and Josias, and we'll see you at 11.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Bye, everyone. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, our first speaker, Stefan Muller-Villa, who is University Lecturer in History of Life, Human and Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. Um, Stefan's research has included a focus on Linnaeus um, for some years. Uh, he previously led a project on Linnaeus's use of paper-based technologies for uh, recording and storing information, and um, Isabelle Charmontier from the Linnaean Society was part of that project. And um, he's currently working, I think, on a critical online edition of Linnaeus's 1732 Laplandic journey. Um, Stefan's research has also concentrated on histories of race and kinship, and he has published widely on the idea of um, heredity. And that is what perhaps has led him to his more, more recent uh, research focus on Gregor Mendel. But most relevant perhaps for today's session, um, Stefan is the author of some of the best known articles in English on Linnaeus and race. And the title of his talk today, as we can see from the screen, is Linnaeus's uh, Human Diversity from Linnaeus's Point of View. So, over to you, Stefan. Yes, thank you very much for this kind invitation. And thank you, Stella um, and Isabel and Abomba uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to present on this day event. Um, uh, so um, I guess the elephant in the room of this day meeting is the question, was Linnaeus uh, a racist and a sexist? Um, and if he was, um, does he deserve to be celebrated today as a naturalist who shaped modern biology in important uh, ways? Uh, and I want to, um, uh, I am going to approach these questions by asking what did the world look like for Linnaeus? and what place did humans in their diversity occupy in it. So I live in North London and I picked up from the internet uh, a charming image of the world as it looks like uh, for a Lo uh, North Londoner. It plays on the famous New Yorker uh, title. And uh, accordingly, I will invite you uh, in a first step to look uh, at the world from uh, Linnaeus's point of view, uh, a, bit, a bit like uh, this view of the, of the world from images that we're all familiar with. Uh, that also means that we should forget for a while how it looks to us today, of course, uh, but I will return um, uh, at the end to the, to the question of, uh, that I raised uh, just now, um, uh, to the question of how to judge Linnaeus in a sense. Um, okay, um, so, 
To understand Linnaeus's perspective, it is important to know where he came from. Linnaeus was born in 1707 in Roshult in Småland. Uh, that's a very poor province of Sweden. It had poor soil. It was regularly suffering from food shortages. shortages. Uh, it was not very well connected to the rest of the world. Uh, his father was a country parson, so relatively uh, well off uh, and had botanical interests and so kept his own little botanical garden. Um, uh, his world outlook is nicely and naively captured in uh, Spolia plantarum, uh, an early manuscript uh, cataloging plant species he encountered during botanical excursions in uh, Småland, uh, his home province, Scania, the southernmost province of Sweden, and Ruslagen, a province northwest of Uppsala. Uh, and like many early manuscripts, it emulated a printed book uh, a little bit uh, childish, um, with a title page and a frontispiece and um, the place of publication, the year of publication noted on the uh, title page. Um, the frontispiece shows the surroundings of uh, Steinbro Holt, the parish in which he grew up, um, uh, with his childhood um, home and uh, the gardens, um, with uh, a lake, and islands with little boats on the lakes, on the lake, forests, mountains, Linnaeus loved climbing mountains. Um, um, and what uh, becomes very clear from this image is that Linnaeus was not, as he is often portrayed, uh, metropolitan in upbringing. In fact, the world he came from was provincial, marginal, it was a small world, it was a very small now, at the same time, this frontispiece uh, documents Linnaeus's impulse to map the world around him and to determine his position within it. That characterizes his work uh, quite strongly. Uh, another uh, early document uh, of this is this ground plan of a house. Uh, it's the plan of uh, the Uppsala professor Olof Celsius's house, famous for Celsius um, th thermometer in which Linnaeus neatly marked um, uh, the room he was lodging in. So he was given free accommodation by this professor. Um, and it's right next uh, to the room of um, M. Celsius, Madame Celsius, which uh, may have been uh, handy. Um, so uh, Isabel Charmantier has actually a very fine article uh, in the journal Historical Studies of the Natural Sciences uh, on Linnaeus's uh, drawings, and she emphasizes um, this mapping impulse um, uh, that he apparently possessed. This mapping and impulse also extended to the world at large. Uh, so again, um, uh, Linnaeus seems to have been uh, almost obsessed with pos positioning himself in the world, perhaps precisely because he was not uh, growing up in the middle of it, uh, 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 but uh, came sort of uh, from the margins. Um, this slide shows um, uh, two pages from a notebook and a, a detail from these two pages. Um, and um, uh, the larger uh, image uh, shows the uh, extract turned by 90 uh, degrees which correlates each continent with certain drinks. Tea is associated with Asia, coffee with Africa, chocolate with America, and Europe, quite prosaically, with beer, Servizia. It is important to note um, and keep in the back of the mind that this same mapping impulse was also behind, sorry, <laughs> was also behind um, uh, um, Linnaeus's classification of man into four varieties, as he called them. In Systema Nature, um, uh, his famous work, the, the work that um, uh, laid the basis to his fame in the 1870s, uh, in the 1700s, uh, published in 1735 in Amsterdam, 
uh, in Systema Nature, he distinguished four varieties, four different varieties of the human species, primarily according to geographic origin, European, American, Asian, African. His classification of man uh, mirrored the classification of four continents, uh, which was relatively new. That is, uh, of course, uh, America had only been discovered uh, for about 250 years. Now, what was new about this classification of humans were two things. The correlation of geographic origin with skin color. So Europeans are whitish, albescens, um, reddish Americans, tawny Asians, uh, Asiaticus fuscus, um, uh, and blackish Africans. He's not very precise about the colors. That's um, uh, perhaps notable. Uh, the second uh, thing that is new about this classification uh, was that um, these uh, four different varieties of humans and humans as a whole, as a species, were integrated within, the within a hierarchical order of nature. All four uh, human varieties belong to the same human species defined by consciousness, noscete ipsum, know, know thyself is the def definition. Uh, this human species in turn was the only species of the genus Homo, uh, which belonged uh, to the order Anthropomorpha, the human-like uh, animals, uh, alongside apes, Zemia, and the sloth, Bradypus, um, and uh, the anthropomorpha, in turn, were one of the orders uh, of the four-footed, of the class of four-footed uh, animals, quadrupedia. Humans, that is, are fully integrated into the hierarchical order of the animal kingdom, despite the fact that they differ from all other animals by possessing the capacity for self-reflection. But note that there is a different sense of hierarchy that Linnaeus's classification of humans might suggest. Not the so-called Linnaean hierarchy of species, genera, orders, classes, and kingdoms, but the equally hierarchical but linear uh, order of the scale of nature. The four varieties are arranged in a series, uh, suggesting higher and lower positions on a scale. Note that if reading the arrangement like this, Europeans occupy the top, as one might uh, expect from the 18th century, and Africans the lower end of uh, the scale. Now, it is very important to keep uh, these two senses of hierarchical apart. Linnaeus was obsessed with hierarchy, but usually only in the former sense of a taxonomic hierarchy. Um, this uh, is actually the hierarchy that also received his name, uh, the Linnaean hierarchy, uh, as one calls it today. The only exception where something like the scale of nature seems to have played a role in his work is actually in his anthropological work, when he discusses uh, human varieties, and um, in a rather perverted sense, in his so-called sexual system of plant classification. I'm happy to talk about that topic uh, maybe in the discussion or later on uh, today. Um, uh, but um, otherwise, um, he is mainly occupied uh, with the Linnaean hierarchy. Uh, but here we see um, uh, something in play as the linear uh, scale of perfection um, uh, in nature. This becomes um, uh, the, the linear or scalar hierarchy of human varieties becomes clearer in the more elaborate classifications of the human species that Linnaeus, is, Linnaeus included in later editions of Systema Nature. So here we have the 12th edition from 1766 um, uh, from uh, um, uh, his uh, latest stage of his career. Um, um, uh, Isabel already in her introduction uh, alluded to the fact that uh, somehow his uh, views of uh, uh, um, human varieties change, changed over uh, time. Um, and um, 
one, one sees that uh, he, uh, in this classification of four human varieties, considers many more traits than, uh, um, than um, skin color um, uh, as distinguishing these uh, varieties, or as they by now had, um, were known in most European languages, vernacular languages, including Swedish, uh, the four human races. So alongside physical characters like eye color, hair color and form, facial features like the shape of the nose and comportment, he lists, um, first of all, medical temperament. Uh, um, here, for example, uh, cholericus. Um, so uh, Americans are uh, choleric, uh, Europeans sanguine, Asians melancholic, uh, Africans phlegmatic. Uh, he lists psychological attitudes. Americans are content and free. Um, Europeans bright and inventive. Um, Asians proud and greedy. Um, uh, and Africans tardy and indifferent. Um, clothing uh, is mentioned. Americans uh, paint themselves with lines, i.e. they uh, have tattoos. Um, Europeans wear tight clothes, Asians wide clothes, and Africans cover their body in fat. Government, um, uh, the four human um, varieties or races are characterized by different forms of government. Americans are governed by custom, Europeans by laws, Asians by opinions, Africans by the will of others. Many of these descriptions express racial prejudices of the time, and some are extremely crude and disparaging. They thus clearly express a hierarchy in the sense of an evaluative scale of perfection. The form of government, for example, read from bottom to top, progresses from tyranny to companionship. That's another sense of the uh, really interesting term consuetudine or consuetudo. Um, the Latin term here. Um, Africans are the only ones for which sexual organs are described in great detail, actually. Um, uh, inventiveness places Europeans towards the top of the scale. Um, sluggishness places uh, the African at the bottom. There are two features of this classification, however, that distinguish it from racial hierarchy of modern scientific uh, racism. Linnaeus did not place Europeans at the top. Um, instead, it is Americans that occupy this position, reflecting Linnaeus's belief in the noble savage uh, that humans living close to nature lead the best life. Um, that's a belief that he had come to endorse uh, during the time he lived with the Sami in the north of Sweden in 1732, and that he sort of stuck to all through his uh, life. Um, um, there's a lot to say uh, about that. Linnaeus was, uh, that Linnaeus was actually unsure about how to arrange the human varieties in a series, and perhaps did not really take this very seri seriously as a question also, is clear from the various notes and drafts that lead up to the later editions of Systema Nature. Um, Isabel presents them very nicely on the website of the Linnaean uh, Society. Uh, there are the drafts in which, as in Systema Nature of 1735, the Europeans occupy the top, but also one draft in which Asians hold that position, Asiaticus here. Um, and there is another draft where Americans uh, occupy the lowest position. It is notable, however, that Africans never make it to the top. Um, so um, uh, there, that's an aspect where um, uh, uh, you cl clearly see can see the mark uh, of uh, his time uh, already. The second. Um, a uh, difference to modern uh, racist uh, classificatory steam, schemes is that Linnaeus's classification was not exclusively focused on biological traits, but also considered cultural traits like clothing and form of government. It is actually unclear in how far uh, Linnaeus believed that racial differences were innate uh, or hereditary. Um, uh, 
here again, one can see his ideas evolve. Um, in 1737, in a note on what distinguishes species from mere varieties, uh, in Critica Botanica, Linnaeus insists that all differences among humans are accidental and should not be taken as differences that justify splitting humans into distinct species. We here find, actually find an explicit reference to the Bible, Sancta Scriptura, um, as uh, dictating, as it says, um, or stipulating that one human was created only by God, hominem creavit unicum. In the later editions of Systema Nature, however, Linnaeus hints at essential differences uh, by allocating different medical temperaments to the four varieties. I already mentioned that. Humans, according to this, differ by constitution, by their bodily constitution, and hence by their physical capacities, psychological attitudes, and their disposition uh, to disease. That this constitution is somehow innate is also indicated by the fact that Linnaeus breaks with the tradition of tying medical temperament to climate. In the ancient scheme of humoral pathology, a hot and moist climate would be reflected in a sanguine temperament. But it is Europeans, most of them living in a cold and moist climate, that are psych sanguine. And Af Africans that are phlegmatic, a temperate that would have been associated with a cold and moist climate in the ancient humoral scheme. Linnaeus, I emphasized at the beginning, approached the topic of race from a position at the periphery of Europe in both socioeconomic and cultural terms. What we can see is how from this peripheral position, he was endeavoring to acquire a view of the world that by and by translated into a universal scheme of racial classification, which placed Europeans more or less at the top. Um, but what were the sources uh, of his beliefs about human difference, difference? It is hardly plausible that he came up with his classification out uh, sort of all alone and um, uh, just out of his uh, own thinking. One source was certainly scholarly literature. There are less sources than one might think though. Um, one example is uh, the Natural History of Brazil, edited by the Dutch naturalist and physician Willem Piso. Uh, the actual author, Georg Markgrave, had died in Angola in 1644. Uh, and Linnaeus had access to this book as a young uh, student in the library of one of his Uppsala professors, Olaf Celsius. Uh, the volume contained a remarkable chapter on the inhabitants of Brazil. Uh, and in this chapter, Mark Grave highlighted that people from various European nations, so he lists Belge or the Dutch, Germans, French, English, etc., uh, were all called Europeans in Brazil. Uh, and in addition, he explained how mixed marriages between those Europeans and Americans or Brazilians, as he calls them, and Africans or Ethiopians, as he calls them, produced new distinct human kinds. Uh, skin color played a role in this classification, uh, which is also known as castas, uh, deriving from a, a term in Spanish and Portuguese. The, the system played a huge role in Latin America, but also in European possessions in Asia, and, and the term caste actually derives from this, uh, that we use to describe certain social structures in um, South Asia. It played a huge role in these uh, early European colonies because legal and socioeconomic status depended on one's caste. Only Africans, for example, in Latin America could be enslaved. Um, could, um, and in contrast to Europeans and Native Americans, they were not allowed to own land or engage in certain occupations. Um, the natural history of Brazil also provides a good example for visual sources that Linnaeus drew upon. Its title page was illustrated and two allegorical figures, a man and a woman, uh, represent uh, the country or the continent of uh, America. 
In fact, Linnaeus lived uh, through a time that was already filled with the imagery of four continents that he drew upon very clearly in Systema Natura. At courts, but also in the Jesuit order very prominently, allegorical depictions of the four continents proliferated in the 17th century uh, to indicate the worldly or spiritual power that they held over the world. Uh, the, the four continents became a common motif in consumer culture also. Tiles, trinkets, figurines depicted the four continents and were part and parcel of the emerging consumer culture of bourgeois elites. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find a picture of that, but we know that Linnaeus himself possessed a small Chinese porcelain, a, a small porcelain figurine of a Chinese man uh, and of an ape. Um, one can see them uh, today in the museum in Uppsala. Uh, that Linnaeus was not only aware of, but also immersed in this culture is shown by the frontispiece to his first great botanical work, the Hortus Clifforzianus, a catalogue of the gardens and botanical collections of the Dutch English uh, merchant banker, George Clifford. Uh, and note that this, the frontispiece uh, indicates a very clear hierarchy between uh, the four continents. Europe is uh, seated at the center uh, and is offered um, uh, plants from the uh, three other continents who all uh, appear on the frontispiece in very servile um, uh, poses, um, uh, sort of uh, serving Europe up with uh, exotic uh, plants. Finally, it is also not unlikely that Linnaeus on his trips to Stockholm, but especially to Hamburg, the Netherlands, Paris and London in the mid 1730s, actually heard of, saw and perhaps even met individuals of African and Asian descent. That he met uh, individuals of uh, um, American descent is uh, rather unlikely. Uh, we know of one instance uh, in which he at least indirectly interacted with an inhabitant of um, uh, Suriname in Brazil, who was of African descent. In 1761, Linnaeus received the root of a Brazilian plant known for its efficacy in treating fevers from Niels Stahlberg, a Swede who had visited a plantation in Suriname owned by relatives. Dahlberg had learned about the medical properties of this plant from a local inhabitant there. Now we know a lot about this local inhabitant from a famous 18th century account of a slave rebellion in Suriname, um, John Gabriel Stedman's narrative of a five years expedition against the revolted Negroes of Suriname published in 1796, which also uh, contained an image of uh, uh, the person in question uh, produced by no one less than uh, William uh, Blake. Um, uh, so who was this? Uh, his name was Kwasi Mukamba of Chedu. Uh, Chedu is probably the name of a clan, uh, an African clan. When Dahlberg met him, he was uh, a freedman already, but he had arrived in Suriname as a sli slave, probably as a child. Um, he was born around 1690 in Africa. Uh, Kwasi, as he was known for short, uh, rose to the position of Graman, uh, that was a, a, a slave who was sort of in charge or a chief of the slave community, but also, um, uh, also performed medical uh, services, um, was, was a kind of healer. Um, rulership and, and, and uh, healing power was closely associated also in African societies. It's not only something um, we know from um, European um, uh, uh, cultures. Um, and one of his tasks as, as such a leader was uh, actually to also uh, conduct campaigns against the so-called Maroons, that is slaves that fled into the woods. Uh, it is from these that he learned about the pharmaceutical virtue of the plants that Dahlberg then presented to Linnaeus. And what is uh, really um, quite uh, astounding about this, um, this uh, episode is that Linnaeus decided to name the plant after Kwasi, not Dahlberg. 
Dahlberg was uh, very uh, enraged about this, uh, but uh, Linnaeus uh, insisted that the plant should be named um, by, um, uh, according to the person who first discovered it, and that was, uh, in his eyes, Kwasi. Kwasi himself, of course, had, had not been the first to know about it. It was the Maroons that he captured, uh, that he led in campaign against, uh, that first knew about it. Um, okay, um, so where does uh, that leave us with respect to the original question? Was Linnaeus a racist? And how, if at all, are we to judge him? And to answer the first question, I think it is useful to be clear about the meaning of the term racist. Racism is first and foremost a political ideology, a closed worldview that takes biological difference as a marker of superiority uh, uh, that also confers the right to govern and exploit others. In this sense, I think one cannot say that Linnaeus was a racist. His classification of man does not form the cornerstone of his work. It was more of a side issue for him. And I am not aware of him musing about uh, the racial order of the world as uh, a lot of 18th century thinkers, including Voltaire, Maupertuis, David Hume, or Immanuel Kant do, do in the 18th uh, century. Yet um, his, oops, Yet his classification of four human varieties has served as a catalyst for later artic articulations of scientific racism. His way of approaching human diversity by rigid classification suggested that human differences are profound, perhaps even suggesting that human races are different species, an idea that became popular in the 19th century, partly through the continuing popularity of Systema Nature which was uh, translated and uh, re-edited multiple times until the early 19th uh, century. Um, so um, um, can we then say that he was um, culpable of promoting racism? Um, to a great degree, yes. Linnaeus had a tendency for rash generalization and the expression this found in his classification of mankind can certainly serve as a warning that scientists should exercise care and respect in drawing their conclusions, especially in public, for the unintended consequences they may, may have. Linnaeus stands at the beginning of a long line of scientific racists that are precisely culpable of this and did not exercise caution in generalizing their observations nor respect in reducing humans to mere objects uh, of scientific curiosity. I would also like to uh, emphasize, however, that it was not Linnaeus who brought racism to the world. The world did not need Systema Nature to become uh, racist. The world he inhabited, as I hope to have shown, was already racist, i.e. structured by a racialized geopolitical order uh, that continues to structure our world uh, to, the, uh, to this day. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and I stop sharing uh, here. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, I just have, I have a question. Um, I wonder if you could tell us, um, Stefan, was Linnaeus at all interested in the question of the origins of human beings? Because for example, the, the Kant's hierarchies are quite closely associated with his with his with his presumption that the that the white European is the original form of the human being. I wondered if you could say something about that and in relation to yeah. heredity, perhaps. Yeah, that that is very curious. He never really says anything about uh, the origin, perhaps because he feared a little bit um, of the four uh, different varieties. Uh, perhaps before, because he feared a little bit to get into conflicts uh, with the theologians on these kind of issues. He had some bad experiences with that. Um, and um, uh, in, in his published work, one doesn't find uh, anything. There are a few um, uh, statements uh, here and there uh, that indicate that he believes that it is the climate that caused the differences originally, so uh, hot 
uh, a hot climate uh, producing um, dark skin color, basically. Um, uh, and then there are some very uh, curious notes um, in his manuscripts about human migration, um, a theme that also becomes important with, um, with Kant, um, uh, where he speculates that maybe uh, there are two different geographical origins of humans uh, in some islands in the Indian Pacific. Um, but it's a, it's a topic he does not really touch on. Um, yeah. Stefan, there's a question in the Q&A box that I can yeah. ask you. It's from Banumati Subramaniam. Mm -hmm. Could you say more about Linnaeus' ideas of race and sexual difference? She says that you said you would say more in Q&A. Ah, yes. Um, okay, yes. Um, so um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that is a complicated um, issue. So, um, uh, First about, uh, let's start uh, talking about sex. So Linnaeus, um, um, Linnaeus uh, um, classifies, suggests to classify plants by their male and uh, female organs in what he called uh, the sexual system of plant classification. Um, and uh, this classification is full of mod uh, sexual metaphors. Um, so basically he describes plants as if they, with anthropomorphic uh, vocabulary as engaging in marriages, and you can have um, several uh, men um, marrying several women or sharing their bed uh, or their chambers, the, the, the bridal chambers with uh, several people, but you also have, um, uh, you ha have uh, metaphors of homosexuality, um, um, you have metaphors of incest, um, that all refer to a particular morphological features that he reads in a, in a sexualized uh, manner. Um, now, what this does is that um, it, it somehow um, associates sexuality with diversity. Yeah? Sexuality for Linnaeus or sex is the source of diversity. So, and he also is actually um, quite interested in, I mentioned this, in the sexual organs of, of humans. Um, he, he writes extensively about them also in his med medical, um, uh, or he speaks extensively about them in his medical lectures, uh, of which notes have uh, survived. Uh, he doesn't publish a lot on that. Um, and um, he develops um, uh, a theory um, in his later years that hybridization, the, um, that um, fertilization between two different species of plants, for example, is the source of new, can be the source of new species. Uh, he never applies this theory to uh, humans, um, uh, although it is suggestive because he's, he must have been familiar with uh, this um, Custer scheme that I explained, this um, uh, where, um, uh, um, where uh, the offspring of mixed marriages is classified. So ter term, he's familiar with terms like mulatto, uh, mestizo, uh, Buffon also writes about this. So um, it is, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 he could have easily made these kind of connections, but he didn't, uh, which is, um, I, I'm not sure how to read this, um, it, it may be that, again, that he didn't want to risk a co conflict with his colleagues in the theological um, faculty. Um, it may also be that, um, in the end, um, anthropology was never his main subject, uh, unlike um, Buffon, who um, wrote extensively about this subject. Uh, thank you, Stefan. There's a question from Isabel. You said at the beginning that Linnaeus's outlook was not metropolitan, but provincial. How much do you think his travels to the continent, visiting London, Oxford, Paris, and staying in Holland in the 1730s, changed that outlook? I guess, as we all believe that travel can change our outlooks. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, that must have been for him a profound um, experience. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And uh, people have not looked into that enough, I think. Um, <clears throat> that um, including myself um, 
And um, uh, there is a new <coughs> big um, biography on its way by Gunnar Bruberg, um, uh, the foremost uh, Linnaean uh, specialist on Linnaeus, one can say, uh, in the world. It has been published in Swedish and hopefully will be published in English and it contains a lot of new material on this subject. Um, so um, he meets the world in, in the, um, yeah, his, I think his outlook changes profoundly um, in, in the Netherlands. Um, there's a question from Leanne Melbourne, who is now a lecturer at Bristol University. Hi, Stefan, great talk. I was wondering if you could elaborate on Linnaeus's opinion on the different varieties and being close to nature and hence his order. I'm just curious as to if he's ordering based on the varieties closeness to nature, why Africanus is always last. Did he not believe this variety to be close to nature and why? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question that, that I haven't really thought about. Um, uh, the, the closeness of nature that he admires in um, in uh, in the Sami um, uh, it, who uh, live um, in in Lapland that he encounters in Lapland, Lapland and that he also seems to sort of project onto Native Americans um, is is in a way uh, a closeness to nature <clears throat> that. Um, that happens through a kind of return yeah, to nature, or it, it's advertised as a possibility for us uh, Europeans to also return to nature. Yeah? Um, uh, whereas, um, um, whereas the Africans do not really live uh, in a state uh, of nature, because for Linnaeus, they appear to be essentially subjected to other powers. They are the race or the human variety that is most uh, subject and abject in a way. Yeah, um, I mean, this simply reflects the fact of slavery at the time, um, uh, uh, which, um, uh, uh, but, um, uh, but slavery um, is unnatural. Uh, because um, because it presupposes um, uh, the, the master, yeah. So it is, if one thinks in Rousseau in terms, it is um, something like 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 a, a one of the perversions that society leads to. Um, so, uh, but it's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, Stella has her hand up. I think she has a question. Stella, do you want to go? Yes, if that's okay. I wanted. Um if you thought that the concept of variety is used consistently across Linnaeus's work? Like, do you think that that is a technical category within his scientific work or does he use it more casually than that? Um, and I ask this because it's odd to say that sex is a variety. I mean, it seems odd to say that sex is a variety. So it means like sex is the same thing as race, but also um, sex is the same thing as a botanical variety. And in Philosophia Botanica, he says, the botanist is not interested at all in variety. Yeah. That's for horticulturists or gardeners. And he, he's a bit, he's slightly kind of yeah. contemptuous about that. So it, to me, it's very odd to say that sex is a variety, but do you think that it's a, the, the word is, it does have a determined technical sense within yeah. what his works or it's more casual than that? Yeah, it, it, it definitely has a, a technical meaning in Linnaeus. He defines it very carefully um, uh, and it is defined um, in conjunction with species. Yeah? So uh, a variety is any difference within a species that is caused by um, uh, accidental circumstances, uh, the climate, the soil, um, and so on, uh, and so on. But there is, of course, um, he knows, of course, about sexual differences. And um, he classes them as natural varieties. So they are a different kind of uh, variety, a very different um, kind of um, variety. Um, so that is quite consistent. Um, but one has to keep in mind that Linnaeus uh, uh, writes a lot in Latin. So he doesn't have a lot of words that he could use in in, in this um, in this respect. 
Um, so varietas is is more or less the only uh, the only term in Swedish. He knows of of, of quite a, a, a broader um, 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 range of terms. He uses terms um, like slog, which is maybe sport um, in English. Um, so there he has, but I, I haven't really looked into that, but he usually thinks of varieties uh, in the way I just um, quite consistently, but, but sexual difference is, is a separate category for him. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, interesting because I think that what, what Kant really tried to do on the back of Linnaeus and others was to, was to give us more a more determined vocabulary as well to really yeah. distinguish race and yeah. and sex and uh, yeah. from variety to because yes. but it's interesting that you say that that's a the problem for Linnaeus was partly his restriction to Latin in his written work. Thank you. Yeah, and and Kant, yes, uh, what Kant does is he points out that racial differences have to be uh, um, uh, hereditary. Um, so. Um, and that is something Linnaeus also discovers uh, later in his career, namely that there are certain varieties that are constant, as he calls it, that is, that do not seem to depend on um, environmental circumstances um, and are inherited. Um, uh, and that also gives rise to his speculations about how maybe um, hybridization play, plays a role in 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 um, the emergence of new species. Um, so he also has ideas in that develops ideas in that direction, uh, and and that step by Kant is really very crucial. Uh, it's um, a very crucial step uh, in the history of the race concept. I think we can allow one more question because before we move on to Josias's talk. It's from Sean Chaco from Wellesley College. Thank you for this talk. And in answer to your question that Banumati posed about sexual nature of plant classification, was there also for Linnaeus a racial classification for plants? Um, yes. So, so Linnaeus routinely in his uh, plant descriptions, um, in, in his descriptions of plant species, also lists varieties at their end. And he has a, a, a kind of system uh, to signal that by, by numbering and typography. So they are listed with Greek letters and, um, um, and they also receive names. They, they do sometimes receive um, their own names. So um, uh, that is, um, and he does the same thing with animals. Um, so um, he, he treats humans really like animals in, in his um, uh, Systema Nature. That, um, and that's of, that was, of course, a huge step. That, that is what was called the natural history of man in the 18th century uh, and was considered to be a, a new way of looking at man or humans. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that talk, Stefan. That was, that was really great. I'm really, really pleased to uh, welcome Josias Tembo, who is who's joining us today from the Netherlands. Josias is a PhD candidate in philosophy at Radboud University in Nijmegen. And there he's part of the race religion research uh, constellation and um, more particularly associated with the ethics and political philosophy group. And uh, Josias is also a research associate at the University of Pretoria in the Department of Philosophy there. Josias' doctoral research focuses on transatlantic constellations of race and religion and the relation between the construction of racialized groups and the formation of exclusionary modern political communities. And he's published in the areas of critical philosophy of race and African philosophies of difference. And also he has been um, involved in, in uh, discussions in the Netherlands and controversies uh, in over the decolonization of the universities. So I'm really, I'm very pleased that uh, he's been able to join us today. The title of his talk is Linnaeus between the concept of race and geography. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stella, for this introduction. And uh, thank you for um, opening up the space for me to share my thoughts on uh, the legacy of Linnaeus. And um, thank you, 
Stefan too for I think the very important work that you are doing on on Linnaeus. And as it has been pointed out earlier, I think I find your work to be uh, a lot more resourceful in terms of intervening on how we can uh, engage with uh, Linnaeus's work on uh, questions of uh, of race. So. Um, I want to share some thoughts with you uh, that may recontextualize or add another context uh, to Stefan's thoughts on Linnaeus' conception of race in relation to geography. And I think it is important that uh, I make it clear right at the beginning of my sharing that uh, what I'm presenting here is not an argument against uh, Stefan's work but rather I'm thinking with uh, Stefan beyond the context of his um, resourceful interventions on our understanding of uh, Linnaeus' contribution to racial and racist discourse. Um, particularly, I want to rethink the concept um, of race in relation to geography, which uh, as uh, uh, Stefan has pointed out, which frames Linnaeus' articulation of the varieties of the human species through Sylvia Winter's view of the role of geography in how Europe constructed its racial others. So um, in other words, I'm not um, giving an in-depth analysis of uh, Linnaeus's work as an expert on, 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 on Linnaeus's scholarship. Rather, I'm, I'm, I'm engaging Linnaeus and I think primarily from uh, uh, Stefan's work to see how uh, we can think about his, 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 his place and his role in, in, in racial discourse, not primarily on the concept of race, because as it has been pointed out, uh, the concept of race, uh, as we have come to understand it, it, it emerges at least within uh, the intellectual discourse in the 18th century, although, what the concept of race came to represent, came to articulate, came to express, is something that uh, was established almost 250 years before. And also the modern concept of race, as Stefan also has pointed out, does not emerge uh, 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 in the 18th century. Rather, it goes back, I think, uh, 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 to the, uh, 16th century, as I will uh, explain later. So, um, I will build my argument on 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 uh, uh, Stefan's work, and I'll begin by just you know giving a few thoughts of uh, uh, of how I understand Stefan's. Uh, how Stefan uh, positions Linnaeus in relation to uh, the concept of race and also uh, to the concept of uh, uh, geography that uh, Linnaeus, uh, that Stefan actually brings to light uh, in our understanding of uh, Linnaeus' uh, uh, work in relation to the varieties of uh, the human species. So, um, Stefan shows us that Linnaeus never used the word race in his work on human anthropology. He used the word variety to mean different groups within a single species. Although the dominant reading of Linnaeus' classification through the concept of race instead of variety is presented as if variety is meant to distinguish subspecies, that is within the human species, which entails stable essential differences between Linnaeus's human varieties. Uh, Stefan gives a convincing argument that for Linnaeus, his human varieties are not separated or differentiated by stable essential differences, at least in the earlier work of, of, of Linnaeus, as he has uh, pointed out, that produce or constitute subspecies within uh, the human species. Uh, on the contrary, Linnaeus's human varieties are produced by accidental environmental factors that do not change the essential nature of the human species. 
Stefan further shows that Linnaeus considers all the peoples of the four continents to belong to a single human species, even though some physical features may be different. Linnaeus appears to have been exceptionally uninformed about race in his long career, uh, Stefan suggests. And despite Linnaeus's, um, uh, let's call it ignorance of uh, uh, discussions on race, you know, during his time, that was, you know, very extensive. Um, Stefan argues that Linnaeus was more interested in developing a universal classification of human varieties correlating with the four continents. And Linnaeus's universalist classification of human varieties is not framed from a binary structure, for instance, between the metro metropolitan or the peripherals, or even you know, uh, uh, humans with reason or without reason. In his articulation of the four, four uh, varieties, uh, of the human uh, uh, species. Stefan writes that Linnaeus distinguish, distinguishes human beings from the rest of the animal categories by not by uh, morphological features, but by self-knowledge. Uh, the human being, Homo sapiens, you know, it knows itself, know thyself. For Muller, it is not easy to decide either Linnaeus's classification are about race in the sense of uh, race as an essential uh, uh, immutable difference because phenotype among the human species is a product of accidental climate conditions. Instead, the concept of race Muller shows Muller shows us that it, instead of the concept of race, Muller argues that it is geographical orientation that was central to Linnaeus' conception of human varieties through the four continents. And my argument is that it is precisely in writing global human geography that the violent dehumanizing power that later on took on the concept of race is instituted and played out. So while others will focus on, in terms of trying to draw a relationship between uh, racial discourse and racist discourse of which uh, 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 we are you know, uh, wondering if uh, uh, Linnaeus's work uh, can be categorized as such. Um, for me, I'm not, I'm not in, in, in this reflection, I'm not interested in arguing whether or not Linnaeus' concept of race was essentialist or not, and whether or not the concept of race that he did not actually use uh, 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 makes Linnaeus' uh, work and contribution to botany and human anthropology uh, uh, ratio in the sense of uh, uh, what we have come to understand race today. For me, what I want to, 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 to look at is how we can place Linnaeus within a larger European project in the production of human difference that we have come to associate with the concept of race. And uh, I suggest that we can read Linnaeus's work as racist precisely because it partakes of this discourse and it continues and it opens up different ways of thinking about the same project of you know hierarchically producing human uh, differences on a global scale so if Linnaeus did not use the concept of race but that of varieties to reconstruct difference within the human species on a global scale based on geographical difference as Stefan shows does this mean that Linnaeus's work on human varieties is not racial and racist discourse? My answer to this question is that Linnaeus's work on the varieties of the human species is racial discourse. And my suggestion is based on two very important considerations. 
First is how we understand the concept of race in relation to the reality it seeks to symbolically represent and reconstruct or construct. And here, I think the question that I'm trying to, 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 to ask in this first consideration is that, is a discourse ratio only when it uses the concept of race as immutable essential difference or a discourse is ratio primarily when it does the work that the concept of race has been employed to do in the work of scholars such as Immanuel Kant and Hegel, among others. And the second consideration is, how would we understand the role of geography at the, at the time of um, Linnaeus? And the two centuries before Linnaeus, I'm talking of the two centuries before Linnaeus because often there is there is a break in how we think about racial discourse, primarily because we, we tend to think of uh, race as, uh, an, um, or the ratio rather, not race, as um, 18th, 19th uh, century uh, discourse that lives away or moves away from uh, religious or Christian ways of talking about difference in relation to Europe's colonized and racialized other. So for me, it's very, very important to, to think of uh, the role of geography in the production and the constitution of racial discourse of which Linnaeus uh, uh, participates in and opens up possibilities that uh, uh, as Stella uh, uh, argued earlier, you know, led or uh, uh, somehow allowed Immanuel Kant to, uh, to have a conversation on, on, on race with uh, the work uh, of um, uh, Linnaeus. So um, to think about geography and what comes before Linnaeus, I, I want to uh, briefly point out some important arguments that uh, Sylvia Winter, raises in terms of how we can understand uh, the discourse that race has come to, 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 to articulate and also how uh, uh, Europe has come to understand itself in relation with uh, its modern others. And by modern, I don't, uh, I don't mean beginning of the 18th century, but rather I, I, I I'm thinking of uh, what Minero calls also the first modernity that begins with the Spanish and uh, Portuguese uh, 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 voyages of discovery and invasion and conquest. So um, what I find useful in, 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 in Winter's work is that she argues that the discovery um, that the discovery that the Portuguese initiated or the voyages of discoveries that the Portuguese initiated um, laid a foundation to what later uh, 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 um, um, colonial conquest would take up and reformulate fundamentally the same project in secular terms. And by secular, I mean scientific, moving away from theology, stop centralizing theology in terms of understanding what it means to be a human and how to map the world, but rather to use uh, the knowledge that uh, 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 the emerging sciences started to, 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 to produce. So, um, Winter makes an important point or makes an important observation that what it means to be human is never a given. It is something that we have to constantly fashion as we define our place in the world. And with the dawn of what uh, Vignola has called the first modernity in the second half of the 15th century, white male Christians have used geography a non-white and non-Christian population 
to define what it means to be human and to differentiate themselves from the latter, that is non-white and non-Christian populations. And in making this point, I want to already point out to say, geography has been very central to the production of racial discourse, more than the concept of race. Because the discourse that race, uh, the concept of race was employed to do was already articulating forms of power that were already laid out by uh, 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 early uh, or uh, uh, the late, um, uh, what was laid down already by uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish in their earlier encounters with non-white uh, uh, and non-Christian uh, peoples. So for winter, if we want to appreciate um, uh, uh, the geographical understanding of how the Portuguese and the Spanish mapped the world with their discoveries, we should look at Christian theology. And Christian theology is, you know, is, is founded on, on what she calls a non-homogeneity of substance in which the heavens and the earth uh, you know, stand in a superior hierarchical position where the heavens is, you know, of, is made of you know, the superior substance and the earth is made of an inferior substance. And this was very central to how, for instance, the medieval geographers imagined how uh, the world was. And before 1433, for instance, um, at least in, 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 in Western Christendom, they thought that the world, the habitable world or inhabitable world, ended uh, in what uh, 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 um, the, the, the inhabitable world ended where the, the, uh, uh, the Cape of Boyado in West, uh, Northwest Africa is beyond that Cape going you know, down into uh, the, the Southwest uh, side of the African continent and the Western hemisphere, there was no life and that land was a torrid zone. It could not house, uh, or it could, it, 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 it could not contain life because it's, it was outside God's grace. It was made of an inferior substance of sorts. So this difference became very central in how after discovering that actually there was habitable land beyond Eco Boyado, the people who were found beyond that geographical location were thought of to be made of a lesser material substance compared to those you know, of Western Christian origin where they believed that God's uh, uh, grace was, was, was present. So Winter shows that the connection between geography, that is climate, human phenotype and moral disposition shaped how black Africans and Native Americans were construed as the boundary markers of what it means to be white, Christian male, and therefore what it meant to be human. Geography as understood from the late medieval times shaped how white Christian males understood themselves as proper humans and uh, Europe as the center of the earth while black Africans and native Americans were construed as less than white and therefore less than human because of the climatic, uh, climatic conditions as determined by the geographical conditions of their habitats. What Winter points out in her work is that geographical mapping of the world were fundamentally entangled with the questions of who or what is human and who lacks humanity, either in degree or in total. The connection between human phenotype, climatic conditions and moral dispositions were central to European geographical mapping of the world right from the first arrival of the Portuguese in West Africa. These connections were earlier made within a juro theological framework, which began slowly to be articulated within an emerging secular scientific language to which Linnaeus be belongs. 
However, despite the shift from this jurotheological framework to a secular scientific framework of enunciation in the 18th century, the discourse on who is human did not leave behind the hierarchical connections between geography, human phenotype, and moral disposition. And it is this framework of the hierarchical entanglement of geography, human phenotype, and moral disposition in answering the question, who is human, which I think defines racial discourse, not necessarily the word or concept of race as we have come, as it emerges uh, in the 18th century. As the philosopher Leibniz comments that the human species has been altered by the different climates, as we have seen beasts and plants change their nature, improve or decrease, end of quote. Linnaeus and his contemporaries, such as Buffon and Blumenbach, including Immanuel Kant, provided a different language, a scientific language, through which to connect geography, human phenotype, and moral disposition in defining who is human. But despite, you know, the, 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 besides the use of this new scientific language, they continued a tradition of inserting non-white, non-European peoples in European notions of what it means to be human in order to differentiate themselves uh, 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 from the rest of uh, the uh, population. So I, I want to, 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 to this, is, this, is, this is the framework that uh, uh, Winter thinks uh, about race and tries to connect uh, uh, geography and what has you know, become known as racial discourse uh, uh, to what came before the scientific, properly speaking, if we should consider Linnaeus's work and you know, the discourse of the likes of Kant and Buffon as scientific to what uh, came before, like 200 years before. And what is very, very important in these discussions is the obsession of these scholars with geography and the need to use geography to position themselves, but also to define what it means to be human, which is often taken for granted as if it's a given, but it is not. So in relation to the concept of, uh, of, of race, I want to, 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 to say that a concept, no matter how abstract it can be conceptualized, always stands in relation to the actual world. And this relation can either be a relation of representing the world or a relation of reconstructing or remaking the actual world, among others. It is precisely because of these kinds of relations that any concept and conceptualization, uh, sorry, it is precisely because of these uh, two kinds of relations that any concept and conceptualization has with the actual world, that any discussion of concept that does not pay due attention to the actual world that the concepts are employed to represent and to construe is epistemologically insufficient. And the concept of race from its early modern emergence in the 16th century Iberia, where it was used to differentiate between Jews and Muslims from Christians, and in the Americas, in the wake of the Spanish humanist philosopher and theologian, Juan Sepulveda has always been about the constitution or fabrication of human groups on a global scale in the making of the idea and the forms of life of white Christian males. And if we are to take seriously the connection between the concept of race or what the concept of race came to represent and the actual world, David Theo Godbeck has pointed out that racial conditions predate racial conceptions by almost a century. And what I want to point out to you is that if by race we mean certain uh, uh, power relations between certain groups of human beings, then one does not need necessarily the concept of race to either produce a racial or racist discourse as we have come to understand it today. One just has to bring into play or support already existing power structures for one to act in a racist 
way. That is why um, it's very important that when we think of Linnaeus' work, we do not only think in terms of how he employs the concept of race, but the context in which he employs the concept of race, but also the heritage that informs his production of these different uh, human varieties. And precisely because racial discourse has been about ordering global populations in the construction of white male Christianity, that explicit proponents of racist thinking have never agreed on whether racial difference is mutable or immutable. People have given different uh, conceptions of race. Others have said no race is immutable biological difference. Others have said no, you know, race is, you know, climatically uh, uh, conditioned. And David Theo Godbeck has given us, I think, very important uh, uh, conceptual distinctions between what he calls racial naturalism and racial historicism to name these two different conceptions of race. And those who um, know the work of Franz Fanon, Du Bois, Philomena Essay, Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, to name a few, you see that these people have been, you know, pointing out to say, by if we want to understand race as, you know, a way of organizing the world and a way of organizing political communities, let's move away from reducing the concept of race to essential immutable difference. As Zakia Imani Jackson has recently argued, we must understand racial and racist discourse as a violent imposition and appropriation of non-white bodies in the service of signifying and constructing whiteness. Therefore, the concept of race as a natural and an unchanging difference that um, uh, 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 Stefan has given to understand the work that uh, uh, Linnaeus does and how he moves about with his notion of variety should be considered as one among many variants of racist thinking. And if Linnaeus did not fabricate global populations based on the idea of immutable difference, it does not mean that his work is not racial discourse. Um, I'll quickly come to um, uh, Stefan's, what, what I find very, very uh, productive in Stefan's uh, intervention is to, to point us to to geography and what, for me, what role does geography play in, 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 in Linnaeus' work with regards to uh, 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 racial discourse? So as, as uh, 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 Stefan has argued, uh, uh, Linnaeus' system of nature, you know, in its different uh, editions, has evolved to actually make a lot of uh, connections between uh, 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 the climate, uh, phenotype, and moral dispositions that actually represent the racial discourse of his time, even though he did not use the concept of race. And if we are to understand race as uh, Stefan has argued in that regard, uh, 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 Linnaeus's work indeed may not be considered as racist, but if we understand the concept of race in its multiple articulation by a lot of you know European uh, scholars and you know political elites over the centuries, then definitely we can. Uh, uh, I think it is uh, uh, correct to say that uh, Linnaeus's uh, discourse in terms of uh, the classification is uh, racial discourse. So, um, coming to the question of geography in Linnaeus's work, Stefan writes, and I think this is uh, yeah a very important uh, point. I quote: Linnaeus's fascination with the four continents, Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia, rather than serving as 
a representation of human diversity, the distinction of four continents of four different var varieties of humans served Linnaeus as a tool to orient himself on a global scale and to guide him in the further collection of factoids about humans resulting in a highly idiosyncratic association of the four races with medical temperaments, political inclinations, and psychological and cultural disposition. This explains why race played a very minor role in Linnaeus's physiological and medical speculations about the human body. But then, end of quote, the question that the questions that I, 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 I have on reflecting on uh, 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 Stefan's point is, can self-orientation on a global scale, that is geography, be separated from racial discourse at the time of Linnaeus and Linnaeus's work? And what does race mean in this particular context, which I think I've already ex explained, uh, that uh, we can understand race in, in different ways if we take a strictly a variant that says race is, you know, the immutable differences between uh, uh, human groups, then definitely Linnaeus was not a racist. But if we take uh, race as, you know, the concept that was employed to produce varieties within, you know, uh, the human population in order to produce what it means to be humans for Europeans, then definitely uh, uh, Linnaeus uh, Linnaeus' uh, use of concept is, is, is uh, racist. So, um, in geographical terms, how did Linnaeus write the world of the four continents? And can we understand Linnaeus' work in the meaning of the geographical terms as suggested by Sylvia Winter as the process of you know, self-refashioning in relation to land uh, 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 phenotype and you know moral dispositions. To reflect on this relationship between the four continents, as uh, one, yeah, to, ref to reflect on this uh, um, um, uh, um, question on the role of geography in 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 Linnaeus's work. Um, Stefan points us to um, the picture that Linnaeus draws in the front of his uh, Hortus Clifortianus, where Stefan describes this picture that I think he earlier showed on, on, on the screen during his talk. I quote, a France piece which showed Europe at the center surrounded by three figures to the left, impersonating the three continents, Asia, Africa, and America, each of them presenting a plant to her and a male figure to the right, caught in the act of removing a cloak from her head and bearing unmistakable resemblance with Linnaeus himself. What this document suggests is that the four continents served Linnaeus as a kind of geographical grid that helped him to orient himself on a global scale. For that matter, to express disorientation, end of quote. My argument here is that the self-orientation on a global scale that is not particular to Linnaeus. Linnaeus was not the only one at that time who wanted to orient himself globally. It is a problem that began with the Portuguese and the Spanish explorers of the 15th century. And it is fundamentally, touched at, uh, it is fundamentally tied to racial discourses, which has always worked to produce opposition Europe as the center of the globe and construct the rest of the continents and their inhabitants as instrumental others of Europe as Linnaeus' geographical a picture that he paints us, you know, rightly uh, says so. In the picture that uh, Stefan has shown and that has, he has beautifully described, in Linnaeus' terms, the relationship between the four continents is one of power relations in which Europe is at the center and the other three continents stand in tributary relation to Europe. Africa, Asia, and the Americas give to Europe, and Europe seems not to give anything in return from the geographical image that Linnaeus paints for us. 
and what uh, Stefan, I think, succinctly captures in the words above. But the continents also say something about uh, the difference among human beings, however they are conceptualized. And I say, however they are conceptualized, I mean, they may be conceived as essentially different or, you know, uh, 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 they change with time and with the change of uh, the climatic conditions. These differences are secondary to the production of the European self and the use of others in refashioning what it means to be human and what it means to be European. In the system of um, systems of nature, Linnaeus makes connections between geography, human phenotype and moral disposition despite the rigidity of um, the order of tables, Linnaeus imposes and appropriates non-white, non-Christian bodies in relation to what it means to be human. It is important to remember that for Linnaeus, humanity has to do with self-knowledge, something that caprice and content the notions that he uses to describe, you know, Black Africans and Native Americans, you know, do not properly represent. If it is also interesting to observe that for someone who defines human beings as Homo sapiens, Linnaeus was not interested to know what the wise things that Asians, Africans, and Native Americans had to say or do. For him, these continents and these peoples can only provide him with the raw material to position himself and Europe above them, something that I think uh, uh, Stefan may, uh, may correct me, something that he points out in the reading of the pictures and uh, Linnaeus' uh, uh, commitment to position himself. My final point is that if we're interested to know about racial discourse beyond the limited conception of, of race, I think we need to start uh, thinking about concepts and how they are employed and their sub substitutes. I think this is something that uh, Stefan uh, properly points out to say, yes, there, there's no use of the concept of race. There's a use of the concept of variety, but the concept of variety submits to a lot of power relations and reproduction of you know, human differences that uh, uh, the society of uh, the society in which Linnaeus lived actually uh, produced, and I think I should stop here before I take all the time. Stefan has his hand up. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, great, great talk. I, I, I really enjoyed that, and um, I, I, I totally agree with your an analysis. Um, uh, so. Um, clearly, Linnaeus is part of the racial discourse um, uh, of his time. Um, that he doesn't use the word race is simply because he speaks two languages, Latin and Swedish, and Latin and Swedish at that time, I think Latin to this day, do not have the word. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have to use other words. And <laughs> but that, that doesn't, what he means by these four varieties is what others at the time call races. Yeah, Buffon, for example, uh, uses the word already, and it's there in English. Uh, it's used in English. Um, now about geography, um, there's something. Um, I think actually that geography, as as you uh, explained uh, very nicely, has always been underrated in its importance uh, yeah. for racial discourses, um, and one only needs to think about things like the triangular trade. Yeah. Uh, to realize um, that its geography um, is not just uh, land and water, it is about power relations and uh, trade and, um, and, and wars and enslavement. And um, um, so, but on the other hand, um, this then raises the question um, whether heredity is not what the role of heredity is. Yeah? which also is brought in by people like Kant then later. Um, and after all, also plays a role in the Custer system that I very shortly talked about 
um, where it's your parents that determine which caster you belong to mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and not where you come from. Yeah. Although mm -hmm. it's always, the names are always, it's, it's Ethiopian, it is European or Espanol uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I wonder whether you have thoughts on, on, on this, this point, um, the, the role of heredity. Yeah, I think that it, geography also plays a very, very important role in the sense that um, um, climates, you know, shape your skin color. And then as you rightly point out in the, in the article where Linnell says, you know, actually we have this black guy who has been living with us and he has not changed his, you know, his, <laughs> his skin color has not changed. You know, there's something that, you know, does not change, you know, about him. But the us already is attached to Europe and the, the them of this uh, uh, black uh, uh, or person of color whom Linnaeus was referring to is already attached to, uh, 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 to Africa. Yes, yes. And it's something that we are, even today we are struggling for instance, to consider people of a Moroccan or Turkish background who've been living in Europe for a very long time to be Europeans. Precisely because hereditary comes in the notion of your geographical origin, where you come from. Yeah. 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 So it 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 played a very 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 uh, important uh, role. I mean, beginning also with um, 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 the writings of um, Zurala Gomez, uh, Gomez Az Azurala the chronicle of the Portuguese, you know, uh, expansion to, to, to Africa and uh, 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 Asia. So no, definitely I, I, I agree with you. And for me, I see a very interesting connection between, you know, hereditary and, and, and geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, 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 also in, 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 in Linnaeus's work also, it takes a progressive, you know, uh, change where suddenly these geographical differences, they're not very important and they can change and they're not, you know, all that determining, but then later on, they become something that, you know, concerns him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, there's a question from Sandy Knapp, who's the president of the Linnaean Society, and the question is for both Josias and Stefan. She says, uh, I'm interested in your very perceptive observation of the mismatch between the species character of know thyself and the words used to characterize the human varieties. This is not really the case in other Linnaean species. Do you think this makes the species classification different, even in the Linnaean context? It's a very good one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Josias? Um, no, you go first. I think I'll take a oh. sip of water. Well, yeah, this, this know thyself is, is really uh, one of, uh, I think, um, Linnaeus's most brilliant literary tricks. Because it basically says, um, uh, because it basically says to be a true human, a good human, you have to do what I am doing. Look at it at the, at the context in which it appears on the page. Uh, someone who knows himself, him or herself, uh, knows how to uh, classify himself. Um, and, um, and so it does, um, it, it, it does um, turn the whole um, classification into something uh, completely different than in, 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 in his um, zoology, uh, I would say, or botany. Um, it is um, at the same time a way of signaling that he is, um, uh, that Linnaeus as a white European is also the, the crown of, um, of creation, the, the pinnacle of creation. Josias, you said, um... I think you were glossing Sylvia Winter when you said geography is central to the production of racial discourse more so than the concept of race itself, which I think is, you know, putting it in a in a much better way and in a much richer way. The point I was trying to make in my introduction, which was that if you don't find the word race in a text, it doesn't mean it's not a racial discourse. But I wonder, can you can you say 
what 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 do you mean by geography? Because we're not just talking here about the fact of there being different parts of the world, um, but the the process and the uh, the the impulse to map the world, uh, the not just sort of the fact that there can be knowledge of the different geographical parts of the world, but the the construction of knowledge of the world. So, can you say can you say a little bit more about what what you mean by geography? Yeah, thank you for 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 your uh, question and actually your your your, your pointed um, uh, observation. Um, yeah, for. for for winter geography is not only about land, but it's also, you know, about answering the answering the question, who or what does it mean to be human? Am I still? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so for, for winter, it's not only about uh, uh, describing the world, it's about writing the world. It's about welding. It's like making the world, but that is fundamentally, you know, attached to the question of what does it mean to be human. And what is interesting in this work is that um, to be human, and in uh, at, at least beginning with the, the, the Portuguese uh, uh, adventures, to be human was not only answered in terms of we are human and others are not human, but also in the process of bringing others who have a very different experience and the answer to the question what it means to be human within the Christian meaning and experience of what to be human. And this also does not only change how we think about our relationship with land and, you know, everything that, you know, is housed on our lands and in our waters, but it, 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 it encompasses um, the totality of our experiences, and hence geographing, world making, plays a, funda a fundamental role in terms of yeah answering this question, and also in terms of um, how we understand ourselves. How and I mean Linnaeus's work also is very very important because it's it's not only about uh, humans; it's about the natural systems. The natural systems that you know uh, 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 draw a relation between land and 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 plants and animals and water and 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 uh, 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 the fish in the sea or the creatures in the sea, and for winter it is precisely this process of world making. It's precisely this uh, answering the question what it means to be human that geography takes a very very important and even a central role. Very good. Um, there's a long question from Frida Victoria Sandstrom. Yeah, I can. Uh... Yep, she's there and she, Frida, you're free to talk. Okay, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much for a rich uh, seminar. I, I mean, I was not trying to draw attention to another century, but rather sort of drawing a line to how the work of Lini was also a founding body of work for a much later uh, a practice of more concrete racial biology, but which had uh, its sort of Kantian roots, just like I was asking, can we see, can we somehow find Kant in Linnea, which of course is, is, is hard, but because Stella just made the point of the opposite, but um, still I wonder if we could see this kind of let's say aesthetic orientation in thinking in terms of what you just Josiah, Josiah also was describing in terms of winter's autopoiesis and let's say this kind of aesthetic orientation of the world um, which uh, which I was then exemplifying in a later example um, where yeah from uh, all, all, all the all the way uh, up to till today I think that's 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 what I wanted to ask, but I, so it was this kind of extension of, of of winter, and I think you made that partly clear when answering to Stella's previous question. So, uh, but that was that was also my link. Can we link this aesthetics or autopoiesis with the let's say extended understanding of 
of, of, of geography or orientation, if we could see a link there that actually already is manifested by Linnea. Thank you. No, I mean, definitely. And uh, there is this general orientation. And um, for me, I find it very interesting in a lot of philosophical works, even beyond Kant, even in the work of Martin Heidegger, for instance, at the moment where he talks of um, uh, 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 the apex of you know Western civilization, and whenever he wants, he uh, not whenever he, he he talks of you know Greek civilization, and you know this is what we have achieved, but then this is what the Hottentots cannot achieve. Whatever is there in the Greeks is lacking in the uh, Hottentots. And Hegel, for me, is the supreme example of this aesthetics, where Hegel combines, you know, geography, consciousness, you know, forms of life. He just brings everything together and maps the world in this teleological movement. And um, uh, uh, in this work, geography also plays a very uh, 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 central role. And the question of what it means to be human also is played out. And what is for me, what I find uh, um, more interesting is that often these discourses do not say these other people are not human. They say these people are human. They are human, but they are not good enough. They are not, you know, they lack in certain things. And precisely because they lack in certain things, then we have the legitimacy to intervene, to organize their lives, to mobilize them. To So there's this uh, uh, um, 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 there's this general orientation that speaks um, through the text, but in a very subtle and sometimes unaccounted way so to say, and that is why I found uh, Stefan's comment to say, hey, let's look at geography here and see what's happening because everybody was busy looking at the classification. Geography was absent. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's uh, I, I, I will keep these two sentences in mind because they summarize it very, very well. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to add that um, in, in the later um, uh, classifications of Linnaeus, there's a very clear sense of aesthetics judgments also going on. Um, so, and when Kant writes about um, races, sort of the phenotype is always inspired by, uh, by Linnaeus, by his reading of Linnaeus. His thinking, what uh, his conceptual um, understanding of what race is, is, um, is influenced by Buffon very clearly. Um, um, he actually does has not a lot of respect for Linnaeus as a scientist, Kant. Uh, but when he talks about the races and how they look, yeah, and um, he talks um, in terms that are clearly inspired by the later editions of Systema Nature. So I think for this aesthetic aspects, um, Linnaeus plays uh, quite a big role, uh, also through the popularization of his work in various editions. If it's okay with everyone, um, let's break for lunch and we'll see all of you back at 2 p.m. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon session. Our first speaker is Patricia Farah. Patricia is an Emeritus Fellow of uh, Clare College, Cambridge, and former president of the British Society for the History of Science. She has published widely in the history of science, including her prize-winning book, Science, a 4,000-Year History, and her most recent book, Life After Gravity, Isaac Newton's London Career. Um, but perhaps of particular relevance to today's meeting are her books, Sex, Botany, and Empire, the stories of Carl Linnaeus and Joseph Banks, uh, that was first published in 2003, I quoted from that earlier, Pandora's Breaches, Women, Science and Power in the Enlightenment, and um, uh, Erasmus Darwin, Sex, Science and Serendipity. So over to you, Patricia. Well, Stella, thank you very much for setting up this wonderful uh, conference, and the morning was extremely stimulating and thought-provoking. I really enjoyed it. 
So I'm going to be moving on a bit now. So by the end of the 18th century, Linnaean botany had been converted into a commercial product. So what I'm showing you is the frontispiece of Robert Thornton's Temple of Flora, which had very lavish illustrations. But it's called the Temple of Flora, but of course what sells books, what sold books was sex. So you can see the word sexual system are the biggest, in the biggest typeface on the frontispiece and then uh, on the left, you can see the little Cupid, which gives, sends you uh, another message about uh, what it's, the book's going to contain. Even Linnaeus himself had become a commercial product. So this picture was reproduced in Thornton's book, and he also sold it separately. And it had been commissioned by Carl Linnaeus in 1737. And from his perspective, I think he saw it as... Uh, a promotion piece of publicity, a sort of promotional poster, if you like. In his right hand, he's holding the Linnea Borealis, the Arctic flower that he named after himself. Another way of thinking about it is as a very good example of cultural appropriation. He's not only holding the flower, he's also wearing well, he thinks he's wearing a Sami costume, but actually it's a, it's a strange mishmash of different Sami items that no Sami would ever have worn. And whatever he might have written about the Sami in his books on race, about back to nature and um, being intelligent and everything else, in actual practice, he didn't really enjoy going up into the Arctic Circle. He only managed to stay there for 10 days. He wrote lots of complaints about how the Sami was smelly and dirty and didn't provide the kind of food that he liked. And the clothes that he is wearing are a com complete collection of men's, women, men's and women's clothes and also items from different times of the year. So, so he's just wearing a whole lot of tourist souvenirs. So this is a picture of his sexual system for pl classifying plants. And the basic principle on which it was organized is there's 24 classes that you can see as on the picture here. And they're organized by the number of male stamens. And then the subdivision is by the number of female pistils. So here we can see a close up. So you can see the first one, A, has got one male stamen and one female pistil. And then we move to the next one, it's got two stamens, but still only one pistil. And of course, there were very many different ways of classifying plants. A lot of people disagreed with this system quite fundamentally. And it rests on the fundamental assumption that men are superior to women. And as um, Stella very generously mentioned this morning, the way that I interpreted that was that Linnaeus argues from what he saw as natural male superiority in the human world to male superiority in the uh, scientific world, in, in the plant world. But of course, this is just sort of part of a circular loop because then the argument can go the other way because uh, males are more important in the natural world, therefore they're more important in, in the human world. And this sort of closed, completely illogical circular loop happens quite a lot in science. So uh, Darwinian evolution is another very good example. And Linnaeus spelt out very clearly the similarities as he saw them between humans and flowers. He wrote the calyx is the bedchamber, the filaments are spermatic vessels, the anthers the testes, the pollen the sperm, the stigma the vulva, the style the vagina. And traditionally botany had been a subject for women, uh, but many British men found it very difficult to cope with this explicit uh, vocabulary and sexuality. So you can just imagine all these men spluttering, it's too smutty for British ears. And Linnaean botany is enough to shock female modesty. And one of the men who felt like that was William Withering. He was a doctor, but he was also very keen on educating women and he was a great expert on plants. And in his sanitized version, pistols and stamens were out. And instead he brought in these sort of invented ambiguous terms chives and pointles. And he thought that botany was good for women because it provides pleasing reflections on the beauty, wisdom, and the power 
of the great creator. So I'm going to be talking about Erasmus Darwin, who had very different ideas about how to do it. And he had coined this famous slogan, he was going to enlist imagination under the banner of science. And, and what he decided to do was explain Linnaean botany in poetry, which at the time was a very well established didactic genre. And his poem, The Loves of the Plants, was very, very successful and they had rave reviews. So Darwin was a doctor mainly, and he was practicing in Lichfield and Derby in the Midlands. And he later became best known for this two volume book called Zoonomia. It was a very influential medical text when his grandson, Charles Darwin, went to study medicine at Edinburgh. He studied his own grandfather's book, Zoonomia. But it also had some very controversial suggestions about evolution at the back. Erasmus Darwin was also a member of the Lunar Society. This is a fictional 19th century picture. And the Lunar Society was composed of a group of men like Darwin and Withering uh, who practiced medicine, were interested in science, or many of them owned factories of people like James Watt and uh, Joseph Priestley. They were members of the Lunar Society. And it was called the Lunar Society because the moon, you can see it on the left, um, shone brightly once a month at full moon. They held their meetings so that uh, they could see their way back home over um, the Midlands countryside. And the existence of the Lunar Society is often said to be one of the reasons why Britain industrialized before other nations, because there was this close contact between science and industry. Erasmus Darwin's first venture into botany was to provide a scholarly translation of Linnaeus's Latin book about plants. And uh, Erasmus Darwin's version, the one on the right, was very dense, it was detailed, it's a thousand pages in two volumes. But he later decided to produce a more popular version, and that was called The Loves of the Plants. And on the left, you can see it's divided into four cantos. This is canto one, four cantos or sections. And the page on the right is an example of how at the bottom of the poem, he had long detailed footnotes, which explained the scientific ideas that he was versifying. And as the frontispiece suggested, it's sort of mildly pornographic, but nothing ter terribly um, on the left, there's uh, the first Buntus piece that was drawn by Emma Crewe, and she was somebody who designed the pottery for uh, one of Darwin's fellow members of the Lunar Society, Josiah Wedgwood. And then after the book became a huge success, it was republished, and this time he could get Henry Fuseli uh, to do the frontispiece, and you could see here Flora, the goddess, admiring herself in a mirror. And the poem is narrated by a botanic muse who describes the changes in a garden during a single day. And she only describes 83 out of many thousands of plants that she could have done. So it's not a comprehensive survey. And it's also, there's a couple of thousand lines. So I'm just gonna give you a very quick introduction. And one of the most striking characteristics is that Darwin pays far more attention to the women's behavior than to the men's. So a couple of examples. So this is one of near the beginning, Colin Sonia. I put that two and one to indicate that there were two male stamens and one female pistol. And it's typical of the poem because you've got one female at the center of attention of several men. And here Darwin is portraying a, and portraying and also consolidating, ratifying a common female stereotype, a beautiful woman who is leading on two rivals. So two brother swains of Colin's gentle name, the same, their features and their forms the same. With rival love for fair Colinia's sigh, knit the dark brow and roll the unsteady eye. With sweet concern, the pitying beauty mourns and soothes with smiles the jealous pair with in turns. And here's another similar example of a woman who's playing hard to get, this time with five men, five male stamens. Medea's soft chains, five suppliant bow confess, and hand in hand the laughing bell address 
alike to all she bows with wanton air, rolls her dark eye and waves her golden hair. So there's another stereotype, uh, um, a stereotypical presentation of a woman. But the very next example I'm going to show you is also five stamens, one crystal, turmeric. So biologically, botanically, it's the same, but he chooses to uh, describe a very different type of woman. This one is the shy and cold, but beautiful. It's what he calls the obdurate beauty. Wooed with long, care, with long care, curcuma cold and shy, meets her fond husband with averted eye, and goes on like that at length. And then there's another example, which is also five and one, botanically the same, but in terms of the sexual stereotypes, is very different. So in the footnotes, he describes how the seed vessel splits and spreads the seeds, but he transforms this natural process into a mad mother who slaughters her children. With fierce distracted eye impassient stands, swells her pale cheeks and brandishes her hands with rage and hate, the astonished groves alarms and hurls her infants from her frantic arms. So this, those are just a few of the gender stereotypes. I'm going to move on and consider a couple of the um, non-European people that uh, cultures that he considers that the sort of racial stereotypes. So starting with Muslim countries, many people's knowledge and understanding of Muslim countries uh, came from Mary Workley Montague's descriptions of her travels in Turkey. And here she is herself dressed up in her version of exotic Muslim women's clothes. And she gave detailed accounts of her visits inside female living quarters, which were then called seralios, and they attracted huge amounts of sexual innuendo. And here's Erasmus Darwin's uh, version of it. You can see there's, um... whoops, sorry. Yes, mim mimosa. It's a touch sensitive plant, which he calls polygamous because it's got many male stamens and only one female pistil. And so here he is, he's reinforcing Mon Montague's portrayals. Veiled with gay decency and modest pride, slow to the mosque she moves an eastern bride. There her soft vows unceasing love record, queen of the bright seraglio of her lord. And then as another example of racial stereotypes. I'm going to talk about Tahiti. Tahiti uh, was the island where uh, James Cook and Joseph Banks first stopped when they were on their round the trip voyage to colonize Australia. And of, of course, the discovery of Australia was a bit of a blow for Linnaeus's concept of four continents. But before they got as far as Australia, they stopped in Tahiti to uh, measure the transit of Venus, an astronomical event. And by this time, uh, they were about the third or fourth European ship uh, to land on Tahiti. They'd managed, the Europeans had managed to donate sexually transmitted diseases. And Tahiti had also acquired the reputation of being a land of free love and open sexuality. So this is Erasmus Darwin's uh, conclusion to his entire poem he suddenly has chooses a plant that's got many stamens and many pistols and it's an uh, this is what he wrote about it a hundred virgins join a hundred swains and fond adonis leads the sprightly trains so his readers would have immediately picked up the reference to Ovid's metamorphosis where he describes how Venus was in love with Adonis, and then she holds him in her arms while he's dying and sprinkles his blood with nectar, and each drop of his blood is transformed into a red but short-lived anemone that you can see on the right. And so Darwin, in uh, his text that accompanies this verse, so reinforces the mythology about the Pacific Islands by explaining explaining that there's a society on Tahiti of a hundred men and a hundred women who form, quote, who form one promiscuous marriage. So I'm going to give you one further example 
that's linked with race as well as sex, where he uses a maternal image to make a point about slavery. So this is an American plant called cassia. And so what Darwin imagines is that on the coast, there's an African mother is weeping uh, when she sees her babies uh, being taken away on the slave ships across to America. Only he reverses it because this is an American plant who's weeping um, when it sees its black seeds being carried across the Atlantic. So there's 10 male stamens, one, um, one female here, here being personified as the mother, cinctured with gold while 10 fond brothers stand and guard the beauty on her native land. Soft breeze the gale, the current gently moves and bears to Norway's coast her infant loves. And so this gives Darwin the opportunity to give a quite a few in, in rather impassioned paragraphs about the evils of slavery, because he was himself a very keen uh, abolitionist. And his close friend, Josiah Wedgwood, um, designed uh, this very, very famous logo of uh, the, 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 the kneeling man with the chains around his hands, the supplicant man. And Darwin wrote in his poems under the plant Cassia, even now in Afric's groves with hideous yell, fierce slavery stalks and slips the dogs of hell. So this is just one illustration of this poem, ostensibly about plants, it's about gender politics, it's about racial politics, but it's also um, about imperialism and commercialization. So that's a sort of very rapid introduction to the poem. I'm going to talk now about some of the reactions to it. It was an enormous success. Darwin was widely celebrated. So Samuel Taylor Coleridge made a special journey up to Derby to meet him. And he says he possesses perhaps a greater range of knowledge than any other man in Europe. But after that, later, there was a huge uh, reaction amongst younger poets, the Romantic poets, really disapproved of Darwin's verses, which was based on Pope, but a, bit clunk, a lot clunkier. So Dar Coleridge later said, I absolutely nauseate Darwin's poems. But they might not have liked Darwin's poems, but they were extremely popular and extremely influential. So there were some sanitized versions that appeared for children. So this is a verse from one of them by Francis Rowden. So I put on the left uh, Darwin's version of this verse and on the right, the much softer one, five tender brothers form thy modest train and soothe my woes with music's heavenly strain. But he had critics as well as admirers, not just Coleridge, he had many other critics. And one of the fiercest was Richard Powelli. I think that's how you pronounce it, a clergyman who wrote that botany has lately become a fashionable amusement with the ladies. How the study of the sexual system of plants can accord with female modesty, I'm not able to comprehend. And he wrote a poetic parody of Darwin, complete with notes that dominate the uh, pages. So I showed you this verse earlier about two brothers and they, they, were, they were both chasing after um, a single woman who's playing hard to get. And here's his verse. Here's the par parodied version. Thrilled with fine ardors, Collinsonia's glow and bending, breathe their loose desires below. Each gentle air a swelling anther heaves, wafts its full sweets and shivers through the leaves. Bathed in new bliss, the fair one greets the bower and ravishes a flame from every flower. And the notes to this poem make it very, very clear that another target of these lines on Colossonia was Mary Wollstonecraft, the enormously controversial author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. So that verse was based on Mary Wollstonecraft's love life. Uh, she'd had um, a very tempestuous affair with a married man, Henry Fuseli, uh, the one on our right. And then after that broke up, she had another affair in Paris with an American called Gilbert Imlay, and that relationship also went very wrong. And for a convention browned provincial clergyman such as Paul Wheelie, this was scandalous behaviour. 
so it's another example of how you can use Linnaean botany to impose cultural norms. But the most famous satire on the loves of the plants was motivated politically. So like several members of the Lunar Society, Erasmus Darwin was a very keen supporter of the French Revolution. And in 1793, he co-founded the Derby Society for Political Information. And some representatives of this organization presented a manifesto to the French National Assembly demanding the vote for all adult males. And the Morning Chronicle printed a copy of this inflammatory document, but the editors were prosecuted um, for, for doing this. They were taken to court. And someone said that the Derby address was rumored to come from the pen of a writer whose productions justly entitled him to rank as the first poet of the age who's enlarged the circle of the pleasures of taste and embellished with new flowers the regions of fancy. Uh, that's Erasmus Darwin. He was very lucky. The editors didn't get arrested. They didn't get sent to Botany Bay, despite the very heavy-handed hints that the judge gave to the jury, they were released. Um, and so Erasmus Darwin was let off. But the, this episode really set him up as a very easy political target, particularly as at the end of Zoonomia, there's a very controversial section about evolution and progress, which I'm convinced influenced his grandson. So there were three enormously controversial propositions that he said, uh, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind was when the earth began to exist. That goes directly against the biblical pronouncement uh, that there's, the earth is only 6,000 years old. And then he went on, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament. And again, that contradicts what it says in the Bible, that all the living creatures on earth were created exactly as they are now. And then he went on possessing the faculty of continuing to improve. He's talking about the living filament. Possess possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity, world without end. So this is a quite clear statement of an evolutionary principle, as we can see that looking back. But at the time, the emphasis on progress and improvement was also scandalous because it conformed very closely with the ideology of the French revolutionaries. So Darwin was set up as a target for Tory satires and the poem, The Loves of the Triangles, Loves of the Plants, appeared in the Anti-Jacobin Review. This was a short-lived journal that was designed to support William Pitt. And in three separate issues, he carried a poetic parody of Darwin, The Loves of the Triangles. And it started off fairly innocuously by just translating plants into animals and that, uh, plants into mathematical shapes, geometrical shapes, using a sort of language of innuendo. And first the fair parabola behold her timid arms with virgin blush unfold, though on one focus fixed her eyes betray a heart that glows with love's resistless sway. It very rapidly became far less innocuous, far more savage and politically pointed. So there's Darwin's version on the left of, uh, of when you've got three male stamens and one pistil. The freckled arrow owns a fiercer flame and three unjealous husbands wed the dame. And then you can see on the right, the satirical version, three gentle swains evolve their longing arms and woo the young republic's virgin charms. And of course, three was a very special number for France because of the revolutionary slogan, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And the Loves of the Triangles was a huge success because they kept reprinting new instalments, so it appeared several times. The Anti-Jacobin Review didn't last very long, about a year and a half, and before it closed down in the very last issue, uh, there was this very, very large uh, fold-up illustration 
by Gilray. It's called the the New Morality, and it's got it's like all of Gilray's caricatures. It's got a lot of complicated references, but you can see that big, great green scaly monster. Um, and that represents the terror under the reign of Robespierre. And he's got three citizens on the top and they're waving a bonnet rouge of the French revolutionaries. And in the middle, you can see there's a yellow giant cap of liberty. And that's just, it, that's called the cornucopia of ignorance. And it's disgorging books and newspapers by people like Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. But then if you look behind that horse of horn of plenty, just in front of the three pillars, you can see a, a pink sort of blur. So I'll show you in a close up. It's a basket of flowers and the wicker basket is labeled zoonomia or Jacobin plants. And zoonomia is obviously Darwin's book. And you can see that they aren't any ordinary flowers, but they've blossomed into the bonnet rouge and tricolour cockades of the French revolutionaries. So although Linnaean and botany might seem to be just about plants, it was also involved about in debates about gender, about race, the political turmoil of the revolutionary period. So his system, Linnaeus' system, is still very influential in science. But it's, he's also bequeathed a very, very important cultural legacy. So I'll stop that. I'll come out of screen sharing. Uh, stop share. OK, uh, so if anyone would like to ask me any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. That's, it's so interesting. It's interesting that the... Um, that pole wheeler, if that's how to pronounce his name. That I'm not he, sure how you pronounce it, yeah. I call him pole wheeler. His, his satire of Darwin, from our, to our eyes, it doesn't actually look very much different to Darwin's poem, does it? I mean, it's, it's sort of difficult to see it as a satire on the poem because it, I suppose, because to our eyes, the poem itself seems almost satirical without meaning to be so. But I, th I think that's um, one of the brilliant aspects of satire, that sometimes uh, you can't tell whether it's true. I mean, what's the famous example by Swift? I can't remember what it's called. Um, but it's, 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 it's a descri description of how um, there's such awful poverty in Ireland that all the women are having babies so then the babies can be harvested for people to eat. And he intended that as a, close, as a satire, but it was so close to what a lot of people actually believed about the Irish, that they, they, they thought that he was writing a true account. So the best satires, I think, are very, very close to the edge of what reality is. Yes, yes. Can I also just like to say that I, I've recently done a big survey of uh, popular scientific works on plants um, and, and on botany. And this, this sexual imagery is, is still, still absolutely dominates when, when popular science talks about plants. So there's a, there's a really great book, people might know it, by Merlin Sheldrake called Entangled Life, which is about- Oh, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And throughout it talks about how promiscuous fungi are. It uses the word over and over again. It talks about their promiscuity. Um, and if you, I, I've been looking again at um, David Attenborough's, I think it's from 1996, it's a television series called the life of plants and again it's 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 all there and not just between the plants but the famous example of the of the uh of the orchid flower that looks and and smells like the female bee that seduces the male bee and it it's this kind of this kind of imagery is not something of the past you know it's really it's really fully in play in well, Mer Merlin at Cambridge, Merlin was my student. I mean, he did history of science as part of his degree. Right. So perhaps he's directly influenced yeah. by Linnaeus because that was one of the things that we talked about. He did, when he he did a, great book. a great book. Um, OK, I, I mean, I think it's I mean, I think it's awfully easy to assume that because Lin the Linnaean classification system is the one that to a large extent has been adopted, um, Therefore, it must be true, and it's completely arbitrary. And a lot of people don't seem to realise that. They sort of somehow think that is how nature is organised. But there's all sorts of different ways of doing it. I mean, it doesn't take account of all the plants that don't have flowers, for example. I mean, it's not not a terribly satisfactory system. 
I think Stefan has a question. Yes, I was, <clears throat> I was wondering, um, um, you started off by by highlighting the um, the high the male female hierarchy in Linnaeus's um, uh, sexual system, um, but then the, the its adaptation by uh, Erasmus Darwin seems to show that it was um, it at least had potential for rather subversive ideas about sex and politics. So I wonder how that goes together, the, the conservativeness I mean, of... Surely um, the, the way that Darwin is representing these women um, is rather derogatory. I mean, he's portraying them entirely in sexual terms. He's presenting them basically as, as, as sirens who, who, who are playing various different games in, in order to get their men. I mean, he, he doesn't... He doesn't present these women in a very positive, or the female plants, you know, he doesn't present any of them in a very positive light. He presents them uh, as a lot, uh, strong and powerful, yeah, yeah. or perhaps poisonous. There's a long sections on poisonous plants, but that's rather different. But then a lot of the behaviors are not quite um, mono, monogamic. Um, and and a lot of people were shocked by, by at the time by what Erasmus Darwin wrote about the subject. So it's, it's I mean, the, I mean, Anne Stier has written about this, that, that, um, um, that the message wasn't one dimensional um, that was transported. transported. Um, so I'm just wondering about whether there's, there's something happening here with um, categories um, or, to, or the terms in which sexuality was um, was debated in the 18th century um, through these adaptations. But I mean, what I tried to do was show different versions. I mean, there was the stereotype of the seductive woman. There was the woman who played hard to get. There was the mad woman who killed all her children. There was the the Muslim woman who um, who was on her own and very religious. And then there were um, the mayhem on Tahiti. I mean, those were just a few. I mean, there's there's 83 plants which are discussed in the poem and they show a different range of stereotypes but I mean I, they're not portrayals of real women I mean they I think they're confirming stereotypes that already existed but also promoting them and intensifying them I mean you, you know, there aren't any images at all of men, um, the equivalent might be men as uh, seducers or men as rapists or uh, men as solitary misogynists. There aren't any negative images like that or any images at all of men. I mean, it's a mm. universe that's in his eyes is dominated by seductive women and men's attempts to get hold of them. Mm. Yeah. But what was it then exactly what was rev perceived as revolutionary? Oh, what on Darwin's part? Yes, um, that that was just a vehicle for for political humor. I, mean, I don't I don't think that well the loves of the plants had some revolutionary aspects in it. And for instance, the very clear statement um, about abolition, which really wouldn't have suited the Tory Party because the whole British economy <laughs> depended on the triangular slave trade, and that was that was why it lasted for so long, nobody could bear to see to, to see it end. Because uh, if you were rich, that, that was what your wealth depended on. But and I think the loves of the plants, by transforming it into mathematical shapes, it was a, just a good opportunity to mock it. But I, I think also the fact that they chose, they, the whole poem, The Loves of the Triangles, is several hundred lines long. So, they took Darwin's views very seriously and they assumed that everybody knew what the loves of the plants was and they assumed that everybody was familiar with it, which is an indication of how famous it was. And so that version of Linnaean botany was the one that prevailed at the end of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Right, um, before we move on, Sandy has had her hand up. Sandy, do you want to go? No, Patricia, I just wanted to say that one of the things that I think possibly was kind of um, shocking about both Linnaeus's sexual system and, and Darwin was the fact that plants had sex at all. Hmm. 
And, and I think that's why these sexual kind of metaphors keep coming through is we often think of plants as being the other, that they're not like animals. And so therefore they don't do the same sorts of things. And so, and so as a result, I think that that, um, that that was part of what was what was slightly revolutionary about both Linnaeus and Darwin was was bringing that um, animalian characteristic into another part of nature. Well, especially as women were always personified as flowers. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, was, yeah, the satire so, about Mary Wollstonecraft was part of. I mean, no one would have thought twice if a if a man had had affairs with two different married women and then no one would have blinked an eyelid but the fact that Mary Wollstonecraft dared to do it was a very different situation. But what's interesting is you know there's no there's no particular reason that um I mean there's no particular the the equation of stamens with maleness and pistols with femaleness is well, I mean, there's a whole biological thing about it, but it, but it, but what's interesting about it is that you could actually turn that the other way around. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way around. Absolutely. And so, and so it's quite interesting that the that the females are always in the minority with the majority of males. So it's very it's oh, in in flowers, in Arabic. Well, in the po in the poem. No, in flowers. Oh, in flowers as well. Okay, but if in the poem, Eretz, if you look at Eretz, if you look at Eretz diagram, in yeah. Naturi, there's only one case in which the males and the females are equal in number. Otherwise, the males always outnumber the females. Well, the one at the end, um, the promiscuous marriage on Tahiti, that has equal number numbers of states. Well, it's many and many, but then there's one to one. So many and many doesn't have to be equal numbers. It just has to be more than five or something. Well, that's true. You know, so, so, yeah. um, so, so I think that's really interesting as well. Is that that that, you know, the minority is femaleness. Yes, which adds to the implicit assumption that men are men are better. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Anyway, interesting. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question from Martin Nicol. Is there a connection between the politics of the time, where a king is with the ruling woman at his side, the queen, and the arrangement of the stamens and pistils in the flowers Linnaeus looked at? Well, there wasn't always a king with a woman at his side. There'd been Queen Anne at uh, the beginning of the 18th century, who did have a, a man uh, at the beginning. Do I mean the 18th century? Yeah, the, yes, the beginning of the 18th century, that there was a queen on the throne, not 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 a king. Uh, and we um, Britons had several female queens. So, and I don't know what the situation was in Sweden. I would be more relevant to think, wouldn't it? what the Swedish monarchy was like to try and relate it to those illustrations. Mm -hmm. Have I understood the question properly? Uh, Martin, I hope if the question has been answered, if not, let me know. Um, there's a comment from Brad Scott who says, interestingly in early 19th century, cryptogamic botany, non-flowering plants in bracket, mm -hmm was recommended as particularly suitable for the study by women, arguably because it was more delicate and less obviously sexual. Oh, well, I didn't know that, but that would certainly, that would certainly make sense and sort of conform to the, the whole argument that uh, this highly sexualized botany was seen as um, terribly unsuitable. I mean, that was what withering and other people were so appalled at. On the other hand, botany increasingly became um, during the 19th century, botany and astronomy were the two sciences that women could practice as amateurs, um, whereas professional botany and professional astronomy were very much the domain of men. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any open questions right now, but just to say Patricia really enjoyed it. And I'm afraid I'm going to look at flowers in a very confused manner. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole language of flowers. In yeah. which, which uh, we didn't go into. <laughs> um, over to Stella, who will now introduce Molin. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, so our final speaker today, I'm really pleased joining us from um, Stockholm, I think, is Marlin R. King who is Associate Professor in Gender Studies at the Department of Ethnology, History of Religions and Gender Studies at Stockholm University, Sweden. Um, but Marlin is an evolutionary biologist, her PhD is in evolutionary biology. 
um, and so now working as a gender researcher fo focusing on feminist science studies of contemporary evolutionary biology. And she has studied how perceptions about females have shifted in sexual selection research and he's currently studying the ontological controversy about sex differences in evolutionary biology. And she's published numerous scholarly articles and chapters in biology, as well as gender studies, journals, and books, which is quite unusual. Um, the title of her talk today is Sex and Sexuality from an Evolutionary Perspective. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for um, inviting me, Stella. It's been a wonderful day. Uh, I haven't uh, engaged with, uh, uh, with um, Linnaeus before, so, and I'm not a historian of science, so I have to rely on, on historians of science for the, the gender perspectives on Linnaeus that I'm presenting. Um, um, yeah, so as Stella said, I'm an evolutionary biologist and gender researcher. And I did my PhD in zoology here at Stockholm University, where I'm at today, and then went on to the Center of Gender Research in Uppsala, and then I've been around in, in the US, Australia, and Germany. <clears throat> so uh, Landa Schiebinger has written about the sexing in the early natural history, and she says that it in the late 17th century, it was a great interest in assigning sex to plants, more so than trying to understand the actual fertilization process or the coitus in vegetables. And assigning plants as male or female was fine, but conceiving plants as hermaphroditic was a bit more difficult. And also there were these ideas uh, since Aristotle about the the queen bees being the kings of the, the uh, bee society uh, living on until the mid 18th century. And despite uh, the correct sexing of this queen bee in the 1670, uh, uh, naturalists persisted in their belief that the ruler must be the king. And when in this uh, 18th century, the king be became a queen, ac acknowledged to be a queen, the naturalists then changed to emphasize their, her maternal role and caring role. Um, and in early modern botany then, uh, there were two kind of levels of sexual politics, uh, says Landa Schiebinger. Uh, there was the ex explicit use of human sexual metaphors that uh, Patricia was just talking about to introduce a planned reproduction in the botanical literature which was by some thought to be immoral. Uh, and then there was the implicit use of gender to structure taxonomy, which Patricia also mentioned. And so this ardent sexualization of plants coincided with scientization of botany and the enlightenment challenge that all men are by nature equal meant that establishing sexual difference in humans became important if women were to exclude it from those democratic rights. And so this was all in the middle of the debates about the woman question. And when it comes to Linnaean taxonomy, it's built on this sexual difference. And because Linnaeus understood the importance of preservation of kind, he considered the generative parts, the stamens and pistils, the very essence of the flower. And in trying to find the God-given natural system, Linnaeus acknowledged that his was artificial. Uh, and his system did not capture the fundamental sexual functions. It focused on the morphological features, the number and modes of unions, uh, which is the least important features for reproduction. Um, and as Patricia also mentioned, the number of male stamens determine the class and the number of female pistols determine the order. And since class is above order, uh, the male parts were given priority in the plant taxonomy, imposing the traditional notions of gender hierarchy into science. And there was no empirical reason for this. Uh, Linnaeus brought the cultural conceptions of the gender order as so subordination of women into his classifications. And nowadays, uh, Linnaeus taxonomy above the genus have been abandoned, but binomial nomenclature is still there. 
And there's another interesting uh, paper from Londa Schibinger about the naming of mammalia uh, and the debate about uh, Linnaeus engagement in the debate about breastfeeding. And so the question of where to put humans incited the change of names for this group, the mammal group. Uh, and he broke with Aristotle's canonical quadrupedia. Uh, and there were other possibilities that were equally relevant and perhaps more universal characteristics like hairiness or having hollow ears that this group, that keeps this group together. Um, but Linnaeus was, uh, he was also a physician and very engaged in the debate about breastfeeding. And in this time, the, the upper class women commonly hired wet nurses, and he was very much against this and, and uh, discussed uh, and, and pressured for breastfeeding, that this was a natural way. Uh, and by giving the name Mammalia, says Schiebinger, to our class, it helped legitimize the sexual division of labor in European society and emphasizing the naturalness of women rearing their own offspring, just like the other mammals were doing. And thereby, uh, mammalia placed humankind within nature and also womankind within European culture. And uh, this might be a bit lesser known. It's the Linnaeus uh, lectures about sexuality. Uh, it's called About the Way to Get Together. It was uh, found in a Swedish barn somewhere uh, in the 1970s and, and published again. Uh, and it's the notes of some students who has uh, copied the notes of the lectures. And it's about heterosexuality and he's talking to his male students. And to my very presentist eyes then, uh, it's very, very frank tone about how this is how it works. Uh, there's nothing about uh, like this Victorian prudishness uh, to his lectures. He even describes his own lust and how he gets uh, excited by seeing a beautiful girl. Uh, and he also describes a similar eagerness to women as in men for sex. Uh, sex. And uh, he describes a semen as produced by both men and women, uh, which is in line with this one sex model that Thomas Lecœur has uh, described for this, his time. Uh, but now I'm jumping on to uh, sex uh, in evolutionary biology and, and sex as we see it today. So there are many different definitions of sex in biology. It's, sexual reproduction, as in recombination of DNA. It's the exchange of genetic material in bacteria. It's sex as in mating types. If you've heard that, you know, this and this species, uh, this Basidium ucetus can have thousands of sexes. It, they're meaning mating types. So two different mating types have to uh, come together and, uh, in order to uh, produce a new uh, uh, fungus. Uh, and then there is the practical sex determination uh, by morphology, genitals, or behavior. Uh, there is sex as in copulation. And then we have, of course, the definition of female and male. And when it comes to the defining female and male, it's defined by the production of egg or sperm, the big or the small uh, sex cells, that is anisogamy. So anisogamy means uh, different sizes of the gametes. And uh, by this biological definition, then those who produce eggs are females and those who produce sperm are males. But in practice, in biological practice and in studying animals, for example, uh, we often use genitals appearance or behavior to uh, sex organism. Uh, and there are many different origins of sex or anisogamy. Uh, here you can see all the triangles in the tree of life, and uh, there has been uh, at least six different uh, origins of sex. Among the fungi, one among animals, uh, several among the green algae, uh, and also the brown and red algae have their own origins of sex. 
And when it comes to sex determination, there are several different modes of sex determination. We have the uh, sex chromosomes, the genetic sex determination among animals, uh, XX and XY. If we look at birds instead, they also have genetic sex determination, but they have uh, sex chromosomes that have evolved from other autosomal chromosomes. So it's not the same sex chromosomes. And the system is also the opposite. So in birds, it's the female who have two different sex chromosomes and the males who have two of the same. Uh, we also have temperature dependent sex determination. Uh, for example, in turtles, it may be high temperature that produces females. So the egg in itself is not uh, sex determined to begin with, it's unsexed. But then the temperature during the egg development uh, decides uh, which uh, sex the individual will get. And low temperature then uh, develops into uh, males. In crocodiles that also have uh, temperature dependent sex determination, uh, there's another pattern. So uh, at low or high temperature, uh, the eggs develop into females and in the in-between temperature, they become males. And if we look at the family tree of ray fin fishes, we can see that the sex determination system has shifted many times. And here we also have uh, some species, the green ones are ones in which the whole species uh, consists of only females. There are no males in those species. We have uh, those that have two sex chromosomes in which the females have two different or the males have two different. We can have a sex, uh, temperature dependent sex determination. So all of this has shifted over the, the um, uh, family tree of fishes. Uh, we also know that even sexual organs can vary depending on social circumstances. And here is a, a picture of a penis and a vagina from uh, a duck species. It's Brennan and Crum in 2012 that showed that the penis grow larger if there are many males around. So they uh, develop this organ uh, to be bigger. And then there are even other uh, ways of determining sex. For in bees, for example, uh, unfertilized eggs becomes the males and fertilized eggs become females. And depending on what kind of food uh, they the females get, they can either develop into queens or into worker bees that are sterile. And there are yet other functions that may be influenced or, or organisms. So the bacterium Vol Volbachia can cause what's called a sex reversal in many insects. So uh, it's a bacterium that is inherited only on the maternal side and it has evolved a mechanism to change the genetical males into phenotypical females. So they look like females, although they have, uh, they have um, male genotype. And then we have many different species in, that uh, change sex during their lives among many fishes, worms, sponges, shrimps, and snails. Uh, that individuals can change sex. It can be induced by the temperature, can be induced by the, the body size or the social environment. Uh, uh, and the sex in plants, uh, ma the majority of plants are hermaphrodites. There exist isogamous plants in which the sex cells are this, of the same size. Um, <clears throat> and what is called sex change in plants or ra is rather something really we can call sex allocation. So when a plant lacks resources or during drought, the plant can allocate more or less to producing seeds or um, more to producing pollen. And um, another example of uh, how our perceptions of nature has influenced uh, science is the uh, the Latian albatrosses. And it was known for a long time that the Latian albatrosses sometimes had two eggs in one nest. And uh, when the researcher then started studying them, uh, 
yeah, so the, the explanation for this was thought to be that sometimes a female would, you know, misplace an egg or something. Uh, but it was also a bit strange because a female can only produce during one season, they can only produce only one egg. So uh, someone started research, doing research on these uh, birds on Hawaii, and they found out that when they actually sex these uh, monochromatic birds, they found out that 31% of the pairs consisted of two females. So that was the explanation for, for finding two eggs in the same nest. And same sex sexuality is actually rather common. There was a book out in 1999 by Bruce Begemill showing that there were both long or short term relationships and they had found same-sex sexual behavior among 1,500 species of primates, birds, dolphins, worms, or, and uh, damselflies, for example. Uh, and Begumo uh, asks why we haven't uh, gotten to know about all these same-sex sexuality before. And he has different explanations. And one explanation is that heterosexuality has been taken for granted. Uh, and that same-sex uh, behaviors among animals have been defined as abnormal in the example here in the title uh, of a paper on butterflies from 1987. Note on the apparent lowering of moral standards in butterflies. Um, and also it has been de described as abnormal, abnormal, but also made invisible by redefining it as anything but sexual behaviors, even if it was sexual behaviors. And also researchers have not uh, published these kind of accounts, uh, both because of fear of political implications and also because it doesn't really fit into the evolutionary biology uh, theoretical framework, uh, which focuses very much on reproduction. And what I've been trying to do uh, in questioning the kind of stereotypic uh, notions about uh, sex, about males and females as the only uh, two categories that are static and, and not changing, is to uh, think about sex as something dynamic. So sex is some, a dynamic process in which organisms have more or less open potential. So when we think about these um, unsexed eggs of the crocodiles, for example, they have a very, uh, they can become female or male. And, and there are these different potentials between different species uh, in both sex, sex related characteristics and behavior. And sex and sexuality may change over an individual's lifetime in interaction with environmental factors, as we've shown, and uh, as well as over evolutionary time. And the concept that we're working with to try to describe sex as something dynamic is reaction norm. It's a concept from, um, from ecology, uh, and it means that the interaction between the genes and the environment influence the development of individuals, how they become, what kind of features they get when they develop. Uh, and here is the, the, the concept came out of uh, plant studies in which they took uh, uh, the same plant and took different seedlings and uh, planted them at different heights, uh, elevations, and uh, as you can see here, they have different features depending on what kind of elevation they're living at. And so our dynamic idea of sex or notion of sex is that sex is a reaction norm. Uh, and it's exemplified here by the, the turtle eggs, the unsexed egg, uh, which in uh, this interaction between the genotype and the temperature becomes either a male or a female. So the reaction norm is all the different, the ranges of appearances 
that one genotype can get in, in several different environments. So when it comes to humans, then you might say that, you know, humans, they are males or females. It's, um, it's not so easy to draw the line between uh, the sexes. And that is something that the Olympic Committee uh, has realized over the years. So in 1966, uh, somebody who wanted to uh, compete as a woman had to walk naked in front of a panel of gynecologists to show their morphological sex. In 1968, they changed the characteristic. They started doing a buccal smear to look at the chromosomal sex. Uh, and some people who had uh, would have passed uh, or did pass the morphological sex test did not pass the chromosomal sex test because uh, some individuals that have xy chromosomes uh, uh, develop female bodies uh, and do not um, react to the testosterone produced in their bodies and nowadays we have the testosterone level as the uh, tests for sex. And now too, we have these uh, unruly cases that are, do not fit into the uh, male and female categories or rather fits into a male uh, testosterone level, although the person uh, is a woman. So there is a lot of variability and uh, we have the intersex uh, and all the intersex is variability in genes or chromosomes or uh, in different uh, morphologies due to environmental circumstances. And uh, I want to point out here that all of us humans carry genes for both male and female sexual characteristics. And these sexual characteristics are plastic. They change due to hormone levels over our individual lifetimes. And they can also change due to external endocrine disruptors, the kind of environmental pollution. And we're all part of this variability. And in the end, I just want to mention two of my projects. One is called The Female Turn, How Evolutionary Science Shifted Perceptions About Females. Uh, it's a uh, history of science, you might say, for the last 50 years, in which the traditional assumptions about females, like coy and passive and mating with only one male, has shifted towards including active sexual strategies of females, variability among females, female aggression and dominance, and almost ubiquitous multiple mating. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm asking is how and why have these perceptions changed? And another project is on the controversy of the sex differences. And in biology, biologists often use to assert essential sex differences, yet evolutionary biologists themselves disagree over what sex differences means and their causes. Uh, and the last decades have then really revealed uh, extensive variability in sex and sexual behaviors among animals. So how and why has this controversy emerged? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Malin, can I ask you a question while Padma's doing all that kind of finagling around? Um, yeah, sure. There's, I think this whole idea of sex being very fluid is, is I mean, it's, you talked about animals, but it's also coming to the fore in plants as well. So I have some colleagues who just described a new species of plant from Australia based on the kind of lability of its sexual expression. That, that there are some, some plants um, have, have so, so sometimes there were male and female plants, but sometimes there are kind of hermaphroditic plants, but that have male and female flowers. And so it was, it was very fluid within the species. And that's, not, and that's not necessarily common. You get individuals which change over the course of their lifetime, but within a population to have that, that mixed kind of strategy is, is not that common. And, and I think we'll probably find it to be more, more, once we start looking, we'll find that it's much more common than we think, but they called it Solanum plastisexum, which oh, is nice. a wonderful name for it. 
and it caused it it got a lot of press because they they um they linked it to kind of conceptions of gender and why why binary gender was not a real thing great i'll look into that thank i'll you. send it to you i'll send i'll send you the paper oh, thank you we have um, Stella and Stefan, go ahead. All the panelists can now discuss. Open to you. Thank you very much, Marlene. And I have a question that's, I hope it's not naive, but it's a, because I'm not a scientist, but it's this. When features in, in living beings uh, evolve independently of each other. So when, when uh, creatures evolve characteristics which seem to perform the same function, but those creatures are not, don't have a common ancestor or, you know, a recent common ancestor. Then we say that their features are not homologous, but they're analogous. So if sex has evolved independently in animals, in plants, in fungi, what, what is, is it just that sex is analogous in animals and plants and fungi or how can what, how can we understand this thing that we think is the same in everything, but actually has evolved independently? How 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 scientifically do you understand that? Um, I think I would call it homologous. Uh, I mean, even if it has different origins, so you can find the same kind of feature in different, but it has different origins. Uh, I think that's a scientific word for it. Mm. Oh dear. And do I? But then there's another word for having a common ancestry. That's um, homology. So homology is having common ancestry. So it's like it's like wings. It's like wings do the same job in yeah, beetles exactly. and in So and that's analogy. Okay, so it is, maybe I'm it mixing is, it up with the Swedish terms. Uh, yeah, that's no, because they in Sweden it, they are slightly different. I mean, they're just these strange terms which are coined by Richard Owen, you know, to okay. look at vertebrate limbs. So he looked at vertebrate limbs. So, but 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 the fact that it's not descended from a common ancestor doesn't make it any less important. Or the fact no, no, that it's an analogous character, an analogous character, it's equally important. But it is important to realize that that it has lots of different origins, which makes it really interesting. I mean, analogies are the really interesting things that tell us how biology works. Yes, and that is often used in, in kind of um, um, phylogenetic studies in which you look at the family tree and if some, something has originated several times, you can actually look at the um, ecological circumstances mm -hmm. of where it has originated to try to trace the, the cause of the origin. Uh, Patricia is yes. Uh, I, I don't know. I've, this has only just occurred to me, and it might be a very naive, some silly thing to say. Uh, it's really a question for Josias, um, uh, related to what you've just been saying, Marlene. I mean, you, you, um, so Josias was talking partly about how, as white Europeans, particularly white male Europeans, uh, they imposed their standards, their expectations, their assumptions of what normality comprises. They imposed those expectations on all ev every kind of people in the in the world. And so, as human beings, you could say by analogy, seeing that's what we're just talking about. By analogy, we've looked at the whole of living creation, and we've assumed that normality is to have male and female. And therefore, in a similar sort of way, we've imposed our own norms, our own normality on the whole of the rest of the living creation. So we've got not only to decenter ourselves as far as that tiny little country of Europe, well, particularly decenter England in the whole of the world, but we've also got to decenter human beings in the whole of living creation. I don't know what you think of that, Josiah. So it's only just popped into my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, uh, Winter uh, uh, thinks that all human beings, uh, you know, uh, can only think about what it means to be human yeah. from very particular, you know, narratives, and then mm. uh, everything that they encounter and they experience 
will be measured from, you know, whatever narrative they have of what it means to be human. So for mm -hmm. her, it's like very, very fundamental to the experience of being human. Mm -hmm. Hence, epistemologically as well, like whatever we know always has a relation to, you know, our experience and will mm -hmm. always be imposed within, you know, our uh, particular narratives. So uh, definitely, I think, I think we can make an analogical uh, connection there to say, uh, 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 even in how we understand gender, I mean, Winter also talks about uh, gender and, and sex in, in similar terms. And uh, uh, the binary that she attributes to Western Christianity mm. to a certain extent. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I agree with your, 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 your observation. Mm. So I remember reading that slime molds had 70, 720 genders, and I still can't bend my head around that. I should be able to. I can intellectually, but I can't really grasp it. Yeah, it's mating types then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but it was described as genders in that article. Yeah. So my, my Lynette, let me ask you, do you do you think mating types are not are they different concepts, would you say? A mating type is something different from a sex. Yes, or I mean, there are different definitions of sex and you need to know which kind of, which definition you're referring to. So mating type is not the same as male, female. Yes, yeah, I think that's where the, that's where the mm. interesting questions really arise because mm. the presumption is that we will find male and female everywhere. And the presumption, I mean, the, and the, the definition, a dictionary definition of sex will say, this general term to cover the difference between male and female so when when we start talking about sex in other areas of uh, in other kinds of animals or in plants or uh, fungi bacteria whatever um, the, the presumption is to talk to you know to find sex as you know as when mating types in bacteria were discovered they were called male and female initially I think actually I think it's your work that taught me that um so yes it's interesting that the we can talk about sex without talking necessarily just about male and female yeah absolutely yeah I think it was uh, Bonnie Spanier's work on on the male and female bacteria so the male was the one who's giving away uh, genetic material to somebody else and the the one who takes material or takes in material as a female. Uh, Stefan has had his hand up for a while. Stefan, was that by mistake or? No, 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 not okay. by mistake. <laughs> Just sticking <laughs> to the rules. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I wanted to come back to uh, um, Sandy's, um, 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 Sandy's uh, recent example of um, poly, polysexual or what was it called, um, the, the, the new species. Uh, because if I remember right, um, Linnaeus also describes uh, a certain genera, no species even, I think, no genera, genera, where the sexual characteristics um, um, vary a lot. So um, uh, that include monarchous and diurchous plants. Um, uh, but um, the, the difference between monoicus and diocus is very up high in his hierarchy of criteria for classification. So, um, so it's actually the nettle, uh, the nettles that um, that combine diocus and monoicus, and it's it became a big um, um, subject for Darwin, to which Darwin dedicated a whole book: uh, diocusness, monoicusness, the various ways in which plants. Uh, have sex. And to me, I, I, this raises a little bit the question uh, about the, the hierarchy of uh, Linnaeus's systems. I tried to point it out that there are two senses in which one can speak of uh, hierarchy, hierarchy in my uh, contribution. And, um, and um, it, it is unclear to me in, in what way the higher units of the Linnaean hierarchy the higher, the higher, the classes are in any sense better or uh, more perfect or or something like that than the lower ones. That just doesn't make sense to me, um, if you see what I mean. And um, so, 
uh, for me always um, the, the, the sexual system, what is provocative about it is, or was at the time, was the claim that plants do have sex. And what did that entail at the time? That entailed that plants, just like animals, can move, can sense, uh, because it was pres uh, presumed at the time that sexuality presupposes the ability to move and sense, because otherwise you, you don't have sex if you don't sense and move. Yeah? And, and this was provocative because it precisely rejected the idea of a scale of nature where only animals possess the, the capacity to move and sense. Uh, plants can grow and uh, propagate, but they don't sense, they have no senses, they have no ability to move. And rocks are even worse. They are at the bottom of the scale because they can't even um, uh, do propagate. Yeah, they grow in a sense. Uh, that's at least what people believed. Well, so that's what Linnaeus believed. I mean, that's how he classified nature. So he yeah. went against his own classification then. Um, yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. Not. No. I think um, in his. Yeah, he does propose uh, the, the three kingdoms. He gives these uh, definitions. But the whole point of Sponsalia Plantarum, the, the, um, the essay on plant sexuality, is to show that plants have the same kind of life as animals. Yeah? And he systematically discusses their capacity to move, the capacity to sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, uh, yeah, that's, that's a complication, Sandy. That's, that's true. He Sorry, Stefan. <laughs> pays respect to these. Um, to these old old age distinctions, but he does at the same time. That's what people didn't believe. That people responded. They said it's pornographic. Yes, that as well. But the serious criticism of the sexual system was: How can they have uh, sex if they can't move? Mm -hmm. They can't um, uh, uh, sense. So I wonder. Um, yeah, this is not. This is more a comment, not a question. But the question that one could raise is. Um, if sexuality is defined by these vital capacities of movement and s sensing, then discussing sexuality in, in other life forms sort of flattens life in a way. Yeah? It becomes all more or less the same, whether, whether it's bacteria uh, or, um, or elephants. Yeah? To but is that a bad thing? No, I think that's a good thing in a way. <laughs> but that's also, I think, the revolutionary. That was also, in a way, the revolutionary thing about it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, and and also is responsible, as you have very nicely shown, Marlin, for the fact that we can still sort of draw out of uh, observ biological observation some some inspiration for rather. Um, uh, for rather different views of, of, of sexuality and gender. Yeah, no, thank you. I'll just say thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. It was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. Um, I think it's it really has been wonderful. Thank you very much. I hope that all of the participants and all of the audience have enjoyed it as much as I have. And thanks again to the Linnaean Society for hosting us, and, and um, particularly to Padma for making everything run so very, very smoothly. One of the smoothest online events I've ever had the pleasure to partake in. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And, I, and I'm, I'm Sandy, I'm the, I'm the um, current president of the Linnaean Society. And on, on behalf of the society, I'd just like to say thank, thanks all of you, Stella, Stefan, Josias, Patricia, Malin, and also Isabel, who doesn't seem to be here right now, but all of you for contributing hugely to today which has been really thought provoking and is, and is going to help us as a society as we go along this journey of thinking about how we can make natural history into a much more diverse and inclusive sort of subject that brings that, brings that, that idea that, this is, that nature is for everyone and natural history is for everyone and the study of the world that we live in is, is not just for a chosen few, but it's for anyone who's interested in it. And I just like to kind of sum up the day in my own, in my own kind of way. So I was intrigued by, by Stella's talk about Kant's appropriation of Linnaeus's classification, Stefan's kind of emphasis of the dangers of unintended consequences, Josiah's really interesting 
idea that I, that has kind of changed the way I'm thinking about the concept of race is not necessary to create a racial discourse. So we don't have to say the word. Patricia's use of botany to reinforce cultural norms and Malin's idea about the perceptions of nature really influence how we describe it. So I'm a, I'm a botanist myself. And I think that after today's set of talks, I'll go out and look at the world in a, in a different way and think about how my individual perceptions are actually influencing the way in which I interact with all of those species that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's one of the great things about the society, about the Linnaean society, is it's really a place where science and culture are not separate. They're one and the same thing. The division between science and culture is another one of those crazy divisions like between male and female that that kind of colors the way in which we perceive the world but really the society we hope that in the future we have been and we hope to continue to be in the future a place where science and culture can come together to increase the understanding and 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 breadth of communication for everybody because never has our planet been in such peril as it is today and it's by bringing science and culture together that we can all work and, and try to make it a better place for future generations, not only of people, but of all those other organisms as well. So I just wanna thank you all so much for coming along today, both all of the speakers and our audience, and please come back to other events, which are equally as marvelously run by Padma. Thank you so much for coming.